Okay, it's after one o'clock. So, good afternoon and welcome to the New York City Planning Commission review session for Tuesday, January 18th, 2000. Two thousand twenty-two. The time is one o two. Again, our regular agenda. We have a presentation on the borough-based jails. So I believe Eugenia, you're going to be giving a introduction. Uh, yes. Thank you, Ryan, and uh, good afternoon, commissioners, and happy new year to you all. Uh, I'm Eugenia Di Girolamo, as you know, I'm the deputy director of the Urban Design Division. And uh, I'm just here to give you a brief introduction to the presentation that you will be seeing today from the Department of Design and Construction and ACOM. Uh, this is an update for you all on the progress of the borough-based jails program and specifically on the design guidelines that will be included in the RFP for the Brooklyn facility. Uh, DDC is here as part of their commitment to provide updates to the commission and major steps along the process, or as you know, at any point that you feel are necessary. As you know, this is the third facility you will be getting an update for, as you've already seen Manhattan and Queens. Uh, we just wanted to let you know that DCP staff has continued to work closely with DDC and ACOM. Uh, to really provide feedback as the RFQs and the RFPs for the facilities are being developed. Uh, it has been a productive partnership and we've learned so much in the process that have been able to adjust as needed along the way. Um, our goals here has always been to ensure that good design is of significant importance in the development of these facilities. And we believe that it is paramount for the commission as for uh, us at DCP staff to really continue advocating for the best outcome possible in this effort and to stay engaged in every step of the way. Uh, with that, I leave it to DDC and ACOM to present you with the update. And as always, Eric Gregory and I uh, in the Urban Design Division are available if you have uh, any questions. Um, thank you so much. And uh, Rebecca, I leave it to you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Clough. I'm the Associate Commissioner for the Borough-Based Jails Program for the Department of Design and Construction. Next day, we are here to present the Brooklyn uh, facility update. We will go through a program update and the specific to the facility, the Brooklyn facility, the built contacts, the design guidelines development process as well as highlights of the design guidelines, please. Next slide. As you know, there are four facilities, four boroughs. Next slide. All right, I think all of you are familiar with the borough-based jails program. Um, created to replace the 11 active jails on Rikers Island for its eventual closure with a smaller, safer, fairer system that will have a uh, housing for a total of 3,300 people, uh, which requires 3,544 beds, uh, four borough-based bur sites, one in Manhattan, one in Brooklyn, one in Queens, and one in the Bronx. The housing for the new facilities uh, for the people in custody will be according to their borough of residence. And the great thing about these facilities is will be a continued focus on reentry and support services for the people in incarceration. Uh, the enhanced staff support and wellness spaces, including a gym, staff lounge, outdoor space, and quiet areas to help uh, keep the officers um, in, well engaged and uh, of good mental status. Next, please. So we've been a little busy here at uh, DDC, uh, Department of Design and Construction, together with our program manager, the AECOM Hill Joint Venture. We have uh, to date issued uh, five RFPs, excuse me, six RFPs, 
We started the construction of the parking garage in Queens back in uh, March of this last year. That's expected to complete by the end of this uh, calendar year. We've also issued an RFP as well as now a registered contract for each of the sites for the dismantling of the existing buildings and in the Bronx for the preparation of the site. Uh, we have this last December just issued the RFP for Manhattan and we will be beginning the uh, in-market period with our first CDM coming up in the next few days. Next, please. So the, the SOQ, so our statements of qualifications were submitted and we selected six teams shortlisted. The first team uh, will be Manhattan, which will be Gilbane Building Company and Alberici Corporation as a joint venture. That was released the end of December. We have Queens, which will have Leon DeMattis Construction Corp and that will be released in the second quarter of 2022. Brooklyn, which we are here today to discuss, will be a competition between Lend Lease Corporation and Helmar International Joint Venture with Tudor Perini Corporation. And that will be released at uh, the end of this first quarter. Lastly, the Bronx uh, will be released the third quarter of 2022 to a competition between Transformative Reform Group, LLC, which is led by SLS Company and Scammy Construction uh, in competition with Caldwell Wingate uh, Company. Next slide. The Brooklyn schedule Update, uh, to date, we have issued the notice to proceed for the dismantling of the existing facility. It, at this point, we are doing uh, some investigative uh, site investigation during the first 120 days for hazmat and uh, structural, et cetera. Then they will start uh, active construction on site probably towards the middle to end of March. And we expect that dismantling to be complete by the second quarter of 2023, about a year and a half from now. The facility RFP will be released uh, again at the end of this first quarter in 2022. And we expect that RFP process to take approximately a year and issuing a notice to proceed to the team if all goes well in, in the second quarter of 2023. And if all goes well, the facility should be complete by the third quarter of 2027 to effectuate the closure of Rikers Island by the end of 2027. I'd like to present or, or introduce today uh, Judy Wong, who is the project executive for design for the Brooklyn site. She will walk through uh, several slides in the design guidelines aspect, and then uh, Graziano Meliconi will also join us. Next slide. And Judy, I will pass it off to you now. Hi, thank you, Rebecca. And um, th thank you all for um, joining this meeting. Um, my name is Judy Wong. I am the design executive for this, um, for the Brooklyn facility. <clears throat> I'm going to take a few moments to talk about um, the site and um, and our process and how we establish the guidelines for the project. And then also about how we incorporate these guidelines into the new facility. Next slide, please. The site is located at, oops, next slide. <clears throat> the site is located at the edge of downtown Brooklyn on the south side of the Brooklyn Criminal Court building. To the south and the and the west of the site is the historic brownstone Brooklyn neighborhoods of Brooklyn Heights, Cobble Hill, and Borham Hill. Being at the edge of these neighborhoods, the site presents the opportunity to address the different scales and serve as a gateway into downtown Brooklyn. Next slide. Here are two images that show the existing jail that is in the process of getting dismantled. 
The picture on the left shows the existing jail along Borum Place, which is a thoroughfare that leads north toward the Brooklyn Bridge. The picture at the right is the existing jail on Atlantic Avenue, the commercial corridor that connects Brooklyn Waterfront to the Atlantic Terminal and Barclays Center. Next slide. <clears throat> on the left is a picture of Smith Street. This is a narrow residential street that has several new high-rise residential and mixed-use developments. Smith Street also serves as a bike lane for this area. The image on the right is taken on State Street, which is at the back of the Brooklyn Criminal Court building and also a major vehicular route for local traffic. Next slide. The surrounding neighborhoods have vastly different scales. The first three pictures on the left show buildings typical of the area north of our site in downtown Brooklyn. This area includes civic buildings such as courthouses and agency headquarters, along with many high-rise residential buildings. The image on the right is more typical of Brooklyn Heights, which is at the west of our site. Next slide. Here, you can see additional images of the areas to the south including Atlantic Avenue and Court Street in Cobble Hill. The two images on the lower part of the slide are streets to the east of our site, including the historically registered Dean Street in Borum Hill. Next slide, please. The city started this work in 2017 to reimagine its jails as civic assets. This work is based on creating smaller, fairer, and safer facilities within the boroughs that can also serve as a catalyst for positive change in the community and the broader justice system. This involved tailoring the programming and the design goals of the jail to promote greater support for the detainees and providing design guidelines for how the facilities can integrate into their respective neighborhoods. I will speak a little bit about how we are gonna be doing this in the next few slides or how we have been doing this. Next slide, please. The city worked to have a ULERP approved in 2019 to allow for 886 beds, an FAR of 11.9 and a maximum height of 295 feet within this site. Along with restrictions, this also included restrictions to the overall massing um, the ULARP also out, outlines entry locations for the facility and incorporation of a 30,000 square foot community space that would be provided along Atlantic Avenue. Next slide, please. As part of the scoping and design process for this facility, we have also sol solicited feedback from a variety of different stakeholders on the programmatic requirements and the design guidance for the future facility. During the past six months, we have presented to the community board, to the neighborhood advisory committee, committee, and we had meetings with our peer review team. Next slide, please. This slide shows some highlights from the community board input, so, sorry, the community input workshop that we had with the public in May of 2021. The meeting focused on what we would include in the design guidelines within the RFP and how we would best address the goals of the neighborhood. We spoke about the exterior of the building, lobby entry, the, 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 um, the public lobby and its, um, its overall look and also um, landscape elements around the site. Next slide, please. We also conducted a justice advocates workshop in October of 2020 and looked into the internal spaces within the facility, including the lobby, visiting and admissions. We incorporated the key takeaways into our basis of design to, to require that these goals be addressed by the future design builders of the facility. Next slide, please. An outside peer review committee consisting of New York City national and international technical experts in urban design, justice planning, architectural design, high rise construction, and justice reform were engaged, periodic, engaged to periodically review the RFP materials 
and advise on the in-market designs. This committee, this committee participated in a recent review and provided commentary that we'll sh share shortly. <clears throat> we will also continue to engage this group during the in-market design period. Next slide, please. Just last week, we had a two-day workshop with the peer review committee to, to review the draft of our RFP, which we'll be releasing in two months at the end of quarter one of 2022. The slide shows a very brief summary of the key takeaways from this workshop, including detailed comments on how we might provide more clarity within the document, add additional considerations to the public realm with regard to sight lines, and, and also address concerns for increasing access to outdoor spaces, natural light, and views. Next slide, please. Currently, Actually, ultimately, all the various input from these sources shown on the screen, including the requirements of our sponsor agencies, feedback from community stakeholders and justice advocates, the peer reviewers, as well as agency engagement, including DCP and PDC, will provide the critical guidelines, will provide the critical guidance on the design requirements. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the guidance is then that we receive is then incorporated into various sections within the RFP. These range from overarching core values and principles that are described in the, in the design guidelines to address specific requirements and functional relationships described in the architectural program, and then into the detailed technical specific requirements of the design, the basis of design, the performance specifications, and the room data sheets. All of these parts form a multi-volume design build agreement for the project. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the design guidance that we, that we are including in the scoping documents for the design builders are meant to achieve four overarching goals. Supportive environments that foster safety and well-being, connected communities to enhance the network of support for detainees, civic assets that integrate with the fabric of the existing neighborhoods, <clears throat> and then, and also to become enduring resources for our city. So with that, I'll pass this on to my colleague, Graziano Medicani, who will talk a little bit about the specific design guidelines for the site. Next slide. Uh, Graziano, if you're speaking, you're muted. You're muted. You're muted. No, we still can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry yeah. about that. Sorry about that. Um, I had an issue with my uh, microphone. So um, I was saying, uh, my name is Graziano Meniconi. Uh, I'm the design lead of the Brooklyn facility for um, ACOM Hill Joint Venture. And uh, I will give you uh, an overview of the design uh, guidelines and project goals for the uh, Brooklyn facility. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so some of the main goals for uh, this building are related to the urban quality uh, of the um, of the building. Um, so the, the the idea and the goal is to um, design a building that doesn't have the appearance uh, of a detention facility, but has an urban presence that uh, convey a both civic and residential feeling. Um, a key role in that uh, context is the design of the uh, facades and uh, the building envelope and the materials. Um, so the facades have, uh, uh, have been, uh, will be designed to uh, minimize 
the interior operation visibility. Um, they uh, will prevent any uh, blank facade that, that is typical of that type of facilities. But uh, actually on the opposite, we'll, we'll have large and significant uh, transparent surfaces to uh, improve access to daylight and, uh, and at the same time give a, an appearance of a building that is, uh, that is more uh, tradition that is more traditional and not necessarily a uh, functional building as a detention facility. Uh, the materials are uh, as well uh, will be a um, key element uh, to create a uh, non-institutional appearance, um, but a more welcoming environment. And uh, the um, reference. Uh, for, for both facade and materials are the um, typical civil, um, civic and residential buildings and other buildings in the, uh, in the neighborhood. Um, the, the reason for that is that uh, we want to make this building as much as possible neighborhood sensitive in a way that each street facing uh, I'm sorry, each facade facing the surrounding street will be designed to uh, have a close relationship with a typical function and the vocation of that, of that street, whether it's Atlantic Avenue that is a more uh, commercial vocation or a ballroom place that is a, a more um, important connection in terms of traffic and, uh, and connections. Um, at the same time, at the ground floor, the, um, uh, design, the, the design of the lighting solutions uh, will be um, uh, optimized to uh, mitigate the impact of the uh, security and, um, and, and um, technical features that are required for such a facility. So it will be uh, designed in a more... Um, uh, in a building as a building that is more uh, similar to commercial and or residential. Next slide, please. So the massing is also uh, critical. Um, as we um, as we mentioned, uh, the same level of contact contextualization that is used for the lower floor that are designed to speak more to the uh, surrounding street and facades will be used for the uh, elevations. So above the ground floor, uh, the building will, will be designed to um, speak to the urban context and environment. As an example, the south facades will be more sensitive to their exposure to the residential area south of Atlantic Avenue. Um, and at the same time will be designed to respond to uh, sun exposure, sunlight exposure, um, due to the southern uh, direction. Uh, the north will be more sensitive to uh, the presence of uh, tall building that are typical for the downtown area of Brooklyn. And also they will speak to environmental conditions such as wind and less uh, impact of uh, solar exposure. Um, at the ground floor, the main entrance will be very representative of the civic nature of this building. And, um, and as well as uh, create a possibility for streetscape solutions, um, connection with the community, um, connection with transit um, of the area and overall create a very welcoming appearance. Next slide, please. Um, so um, site and access to the building, there are two main uh, topic is the uh, pedestrian access and the vehicular access. The pedestrian access is designed uh, to be uh, greatly uh, improved with uh, wayfinding solutions and streetscape elements that would facilitate the circulation around the building and would make that um, 
view and accessibility um, of their building um, as a, as a uh, welcoming environment. The transparency of the facades at the ground floor will also enhance the uh, presence of the uh, ground floor lobby and the community space that are uh, anticipated to be at the corner of uh, Borum and Atlantic and along Atlantic Avenue. Uh, vehicular access will be placed more mostly on the northern and eastern uh, portion of the um, of the lot. However, those areas will not be designed as a back of the house, but they um, it will be giving the same uh, level of design, detail, and attention as the uh, front entrance facades. Um, so there will be implemented solution that minimize the impact of traffic and uh, enhance a safe environment for both pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Um, some typical example of that is uh, creating recessed parking entrance to improve um, access with uh, vehicular traffic into the building, uh, widening of uh, sidewalk at pinch points, uh, presence of bicycle lanes around the uh, lot, and, um, and, and other similar solutions. Um, next slide, please. Um, so um, regarding um, the presence of public and open spaces, there will be uh, a, a, a big effort to create an improved uh, pedestrian experience. Um, this will be um, facilitated by the presence of active frontages, mostly along Borum, uh, Borum Place, Atlantic Avenue, and wrapping around the corner of uh, Smith Street. Uh, those facades we will have a sufficient degree of permeability and accessibility, as many of those areas will be uh, open and accessible to the public. And uh, furthermore, there will be a creation of um, open spaces at the visitor entry to uh, create relief for pedestrian traffic and pedestrian circulation. Um, also, the landscape solutions will be important uh, to uh, improve the uh, pedestrian experience. Um, they will incorporate safety and blast protection solution uh, that are in line with the downtown Brooklyn partnership guidelines. Um, so they will be designed in a way that is familiar to the surrounding areas. Uh, and at the same time, they will minimize the impact of security features uh, along the um, along the perimeter of the building. Um, and uh, with that, I believe that uh, I will leave it to Rebecca to present the next steps of the project. Good afternoon. That uh, completes our presentation for today. Uh, you're probably wondering what's next. Uh, we'll be releasing the Brooklyn facility RFP um, probably towards the end of March and then transition into the in-market period of the procurement process, meeting with the, the two teams. The, we will then advance through the in-market period for the Manhattan facility, which began uh, in the end of December and the development of RFP documents for Queens and Bronx facilities. We'll, we will continue to share ongoing program progress updates and continue stakeholder and community engagement and design input meetings. And our next presentation will be in the, for, of the Bronx site, um, the Bronx facility in the third quarter of this year. I am pleased to say we have uh, representatives from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, as well as the Department of Corrections and the Correctional Health Services. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, team, for that presentation. Uh, does the commission have any questions or comments that they'd like to ask while we have this team here? I, 
Oh, do I raise my hand? Oh. Vi sorry, Vice Chair Knuckles. <laughs> Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, you're on mute, Vice Chair. Yeah, I'll, I'll defer to our newest okay. member and uh, let her ask her question. Okay. Then I'll. Okay. Thank, thank you. Commissioner Goodrich. Thank you. Um, I, one, one of the main things I was thinking, thank you for the presentation. One of the main things I was wondering is one of the criticisms of, one of the main criticisms, especially now of Rikers is that the, if you see a picture of the jail cells, it's, it's literally like multiple people in one jail cell. And uh, I know you spoke about the light, but another issue has been the ventilation. And I'm wondering, um, you know, obviously there's been another conversation about the purpose of jails period, but aside from that, I'm wondering how the design would incorporate really ameliorating the issue of, of um, the structure uh, of it being not, first of all, not built for multiple people to be in one cell and also when they are, or, you know, and they shouldn't be, but regardless of how many people are in one cell, the, the next sub question is, you know, can, can you talk a bit more about the ventilation? Well, we've actually gone to great lengths to improve ventilation. One of the main problems at Rikers Island is they do not have um, air conditioning in most of the facilities. They have uh, windows that do not open. In this facility, all cells, housing units will have operable window vents so that the the person in custody can control the ventilation in and out of their window. We will also be, uh, our engineering staff has, has set up a system that is, serves, a, they're smaller units, they serve uh, fewer floors so that if one part of the building goes out, the whole building doesn't go out, which has been a, a problem when you have one system serving the entire building. So we're trying to build in safeguards so that those kinds of uh, ventilation issues, cooling issues, heating issues are, are at a minimum with the new building. On uh, each, each cell is only, uh, only has one person. Um, I can't address why DOC might have two or three in, in a Rikers right now. 20, yeah, it's 20. The, the um, other, you know, I know that the, the way that the, the the structure and the way that uh, you know the jails are built are very different from that's a separate question of how they're run so I, i'm aware of that but my second question is there's been um you know certainly a lot of conversations about um you know obviously the humanity in the architecture and the structure and one of them has been and this i think was from this was from the American Institute of Architects, they have released a statement about just a racial justice component. I saw that there is a peer review faculty, but um, I guess what I'm wondering is, is there a specific, you know, is there, there's one thing to have like a diverse, you know, diverse set, set of people who are um, in the planning. And I think what I'm wondering is apart from that, is there a specific equity plan or is there a specific racial justice component where this is specifically being talked about? Uh, in On the, the um, peer review committee are justice advocates and uh, people who, architects who have led the way in uh, reforming of jails and prisons. We have Goodrum, uh, her last name escapes me at the moment, but she designed the Halden prison in Norway, which is held up as the example to follow in terms of normalized uh, housing and um, facility design. So we have a uh, high rise uh, specialist. We have um, architects from across the, the spectrum um, assisting, as well as during the outreach, we are meeting with justice advocates and people formerly incarcerated who are helping us to understand how to make things a little bit easier to, um, to uh, live with. 
Um, let me let me just rephrase the question. Um, what I'm asking is, is there like, for example, let's say a, um, a company has a diverse set of directors um, and board members, um, and then a separate and apart from that, another group or maybe the same group creates an actual equity plan um, to enact the, you know, whatever it is, a, a policy. I'm wondering if there is, because I think, and I'm asking this because that's been the specific um, criticism with jails in general in New York City, and particularly with Rikers, that there's no specific equity-minded or, or a specific, um, you know, addressing specifically um, racial justice component. And so that's what, and, and, and you know, there, it also has been said in response, well, you know, there's a diverse set of people working on it. And then in the counter responses, uh, that's not the same as a specific equity plan. So that's what I'm wondering, because that is one of the criticisms. So I think it would be good to speak to that. Uh, we have uh, representatives from uh, Mark J and DOC. I'm not sure if they want to add anything or if not, we could get back to you with our ideas in that area. Yeah, that I'm would be- I'm not prepared to, to answer it right now. Okay, got it. Thank you. I appreciate um, your response. Thank you. Sorry, this um, is Sasha Ginsburg you. from the Department of Correction. Can you hear me? Commissioner, I mean, uh, Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes, thank oh, you. Sure, please, please. Uh, Go ahead. A couple of questions. Do we, do we know how many people are currently housed in the uh, Brooklyn uh, facility, the existing Brooklyn facility? Um. There is no one housed there. I'm sorry. There's no one housed in the Brooklyn. Oh, okay. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I may I be can. having. Okay. Yes. So, sorry, my name is Sasha Ginsburg. Go ahead. Yep, my name is Sasha Ginsburg, and I'm the executive director of the borough-based jail system at DOC. Um, the Brooklyn Detention Center is currently empty. There is no one that spends an overnight stay there. It's only used right now for court production purposes. So we are, um, you know, we are still using specific aspects of the facility, but there has been no one housed there now for a number of years. Okay, thank you. Um, secondly, I'm just curious as to, uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the uh, RFP for the design of the structure, uh, will you limit, would you limit the design of each facility to uh, one firm or is it possible that one firm could respond to uh, more than one RFP? Well, we've already uh, selected the short list for each facility. Um, if perhaps we could go back to slide um, five or six. No, I understand the, the, uh, the teams, but the RFP now, well, the RFP now is for uh, the design, is it not? It's both design and construction. The design oh, build okay. process where the, the architect and the builder are on the same team and they work together to uh, okay, so, construct all right. the building. All right, okay, yes, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm now clearer with that, okay. All right, thank okay. you. Thank you. Could, can I just follow up on um, the vice chair's question? Because I think that the, the confusion a bit is an RFP where you've already selected the, you know, designated, uh, you know, firm that's going to do the work. And so if you could clarify for us actually what will occur during the RFP, because we typically think of it as a competition between firms to see who gets it. Now that we yeah. know who's doing it in two of the cases, what is the RFP actually going to accomplish or do? Thank you, Chair. Well, during the, the, um, the process, when we have a singular team, they are shortlisted, they are not selected. So nothing is guaranteed to them. They have to meet our requirements. They have to meet the, the basis of design. They have to provide a, a um, guaranteed maximum price 
as well as provide a, um, a fee amount um, and a proposal at the end of the RFP period. We then go through a very rigorous process of reviewing that and making sure that it does address the issues and concerns in the uh, basis of design and in the RFP process. It's graded according to the design, uh, according to the team composition, their experience, and uh, several other um, criteria. But the design of the building itself is about 50% of the process of the evaluation criteria. So they have to step up and they have to provide us with the kind of building that we're looking for as the kind of press we're, we're looking for. But this is not a, a low bid. This is a best value contract. So, how, so is it theoretically the possible that they won't achieve what you're asking for here? Is that possible? And then what would happen? Of course, they 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 may not um, they may not meet the terms. I mean, the the RFP is about five thousand pages, so they have a lot of things that they need to address, and we have a whole team of people who are going to do nothing more than then make sure that they do that. Uh, everything from how many outlets they have in the in the housing units to how much light is in the cell, how large the windows are, all that criteria. And, that, and we have a set budget for them to work on. So it, um, we want the best package. And if the team is not producing and, and not wanting to meet with us and create the kind of design we're looking for, then most certainly there are other options that they would not receive it. Thank you. Um, thank you. Commissioner Ron Prashad. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, uh, you alluded to one of the questions I was gonna ask. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about is now that you have, have, have had a peer review, when can we expect to see revised drawings? Uh, or And also, has there been any change to the program since the last time we've seen this? And one other comment I want, just want to make, when you, I guess when you do show the Bronx, I think it would be helpful if you do show, since it's been a while, plans, uh, the plans that were initially presented. That way, you know, it's just good for us to get a recap uh, so that way we can see if any other changes were made. So getting back to the peer review, now that they've had a few sessions, I guess, with the peer review team, uh, when can we expect to see revised plans incorporating those ideas from the from that team? Well, there are not there are no plans yet. The architectural um, team of the design build team has not submitted anything yet. I think what you're referring to are from the capital project. Um, uh, project scoping document that was created during the Euler process. And that is not what the eventual building will look like. Um, however, the, the basis of design, the program, and the scope of work for the, for the program and each building was developed in the interim uh, year and a half. We're still developing it by site. Um, to, to make sure that we include everything that the Department of Corrections needs, the, the Correctional Health Services needs, um, but there is no there is no plan yet from a design builder. Okay, and do you know what the projected budget? Are you still on pace to keep with the budget that was initially projected for this facility? Yes, it's a bit challenging with the current inflation, but we believe we can bring it in uh, at the previous budget. And what is that number? I believe it's $8.1 billion. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bernie. Thank you. Um, hi, Rebecca. Thanks for the presentation. Hello. Hi. Um, good, I'm fine. How are you? Good. Um, so a couple of questions uh, on the uh, demolition of the existing building that's going on now. What are we doing about the uh, uh, solid construction waste disposal? 
Are we taking opportunities to recycle? Uh, what, 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 how is that being handled? And who is, who is doing it? It is uh, consistent with LEED um, requirements for LEED Gold. All of the material that can be recycled will be recycled. Uh, mm -hmm. I have uh, someone from the team or from ACOM. Uh, Nina, do you want to take that question? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so there is a, a plan to do recycling and to have the um, materials all sorted and um, brought into recycling. So um, that is absolutely part of the plan uh, to move that forward. Okay, good, thank you. Um, and then the next question, Rebecca, um, you know, in terms of Atlantic Avenue, the frontage, um, at one time we had envisioned that as being a retail frontage consistent with the retail corridor on Atlantic, and it was ultimately converted to a community facility. So we now have that entire frontage um, occupied by, we don't know yet, and maybe, we, maybe you can tell us if we have any ideas about that. And I'm just concerned about the uh, ability of that community facility to actually activate that frontage. And I'm just concerned that it will become ultimately just a dead space and won't be as active as we hope it would be. So can you speak to that? Uh, I believe that the programming of the space is, uh, I will leave it to um, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, uh, who is working on that. We are doing what we can to create a space that can be programmed in a variety of ways. Um, it's prime territory, but again, you're correct. It's, it may be a challenge to fill 30,000 square feet. Uh, Nadine, are you... Yep. Um, can you hear me? I was trying to answer a previous. Oh, sure. yep. You can hear yep. me? Hi, Go David. Um, so yes, that was, um, is being pro, we don't have a actual tenant there yet, um, but is community space per the, the community's request. Um, and I think, you know, we would be looking for, you know, something that would activate the ground floor. Um, I know of a building not too far from this site that has a Brooklyn Ballet that is considered a community space. So it could be, you know, I think a community space we is, is you know, can activate the street. I hear what you're saying, absolutely. Um, you know, mm -hmm. as soon as we have an idea of who that tenant may be, you know, we could, we could report out on that. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think it might make sense to subdivide the space into smaller, portions to have more than one occupant? I, I believe that's a possibility. I, I don't, I'm uh -huh. not sure. Rebecca could, I mean, I don't know that anything is set in stone in regards to that. Is uh, No, it, the only, the only criteria we are imposing on it is that it's a two level space, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't have uh, retail on the first floor and offices on the second floor or something, or, mm -hmm two story, whatever, um, we're trying to create the maximum flexibility with the mm -hmm. uh, utilities and um, lighting, facade, et cetera. Yeah. You know, it, it might be possible to reinstate the transparency requirements that were unfortunately eliminated uh, into the lease with the uh, community group. So at least we can ensure there's some transparency along that facade. Okay. Noted. Uh, and I, so, thank you. And I had just one third question. I notice on your um, schedule, on your timeline, it's a pretty tight finish to get to uh, the 2027 in anticipation of the closing of Rikers. And I'm just aware of the fact that, as you well know, Rebecca, you know, when you finish a building, there's quite a lot of time involved in operation and ramp up and commissioning and staffing and blah, blah, blah. So it could be even when you finish in 2027, it won't be an occupied facility. So I'm wondering if that bumps up against the requirement to close Rikers, what's going to happen? Well, we have uh, programmed into the schedule a six-month shakeout that starts prior to August of 2027, so that DOC will be coming in, learning the systems, as well as shaking out the computer systems, security systems, commissioning and all those kinds of things. Uh, what happens if we go up against the um, close Rikers date? Um, 
I can't answer that at the moment because I think we'll be done before that. Okay. Right. From your lips and all that, you know? Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. That, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Bernie. Um, Vice Chair Knuckles, you have another question? I just want to make sure I understand the process because uh, except for Queens, you have teams uh, that will uh, respond in competition to one another vis-a-vis uh, -vis the RFP. Um, but in Queens, you've apparently uh, selected Dematis. So what, what is the RFP uh, to ascertain in that case? in this case? Well, this goes again to Chair Lamont's question regarding both Manhattan and Queens have a singular team in competition. And they're, the competition is really against themselves to make sure that they incorporate the items in the, all, all of the different program items in the RFP. There are specific programming requirements, size requirements, materials requirements, um, size, uh, all of the different constraints uh, of a design and an operation of this type. So they are required to meet all of those criteria uh, as well as provide us with a guaranteed maximum price and uh, some other information that would um, basically confirm that they should move forward and that we should award a contract to them. But it's not, it's not a done deal. They have a lot of work to do before we get to that point. Can so I just, we can get you more if, information right, on, on how that process is going to work. So if for, if for whatever just, reason, if, if for whatever yeah. reason the Mattis doesn't meet the, the mark, you'll have to do another RFP. Yeah. 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 You know, I think what yes. might be a little confusing here is the use of this term RFP. I think in the real estate world, you might be, you might hear this being called a BFO, a best and final offer. So you've got your teams lined up and you're not closing the deal until you get a right. best and final offer from either one or, other, or more of the teams. So that's, if you think about it that way, that's more of, I think, what you're doing, Rebecca, no? Well, they, all they've done to date is provide their qualifications. They have not uh, presented a plan or a management plan of how they're going to do this. They've not presented any sort of uh, layout plans of how they're going to approach it. Uh, as you know, correctional design and programming is extremely difficult, very complicated. And the team needs to be able to show that they're capable of doing that through presenting to us uh, information that would would support that that idea so the process at least as it relates to queens was such that you uh, you were uh, you didn't narrow it to two entities but only one is that what happened to you it, it's a, it's a rather complicated uh, yes. if i could i'd like to submit some information to you explaining more clearly how that how that works from our uh, agency chief contracting officer. But Ken, um, sorry, Vice Chair, just to, sorry. Yes. I just want to make it clear that it is both Queens and Manhattan that are yes. facilities that have one one bidder at this point. Two so Gil Bain and, and uh, Albert okay. Ricci are- Thank you. Are I do think it would be helpful if you okay. a team. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I thought Alberici was a joint venture Marine. unto itself. I didn't know they were a joint yeah. venture with uh, with uh, mm -hmm. Gil Bain. Uh, yeah, I mean, I it's obvious I, I need further clarity on this. Yeah. So, uh, you know, whatever you could provide, I'd very much appreciate. Certainly. Um, Commissioner Marine. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Rebecca, I, I mean, I had a bunch of questions, most of which have been asked and answered, but the one that still kind of sticks out at me is the one of cost. And, you know, I heard the word inflation. I also heard the word, you know, um, depending on what the price is. So let's just say for a minute that it doesn't come in at the price that 
we think it should, or they, or there has to be some cuts because of inflation. Where would where would you see cuts? Um, I know that um, there has been a question um, by Commissioner Goodrich about the size of windows, ventilation, the the more um, essential things to a jail that definitely should not be cut. So at the end of the day, if something has to be cut, what do you think would not be um, completed or, or included in the, in the jail's proposal if, if there's not enough money to complete something, a task? Uh, well, I, I think to be fair, we would have to go back to the Department of Corrections and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and work together to find out if there's some way to shave program space um, there's parking spaces in each of the buildings that might be sacrificed. Um, there's not a lot of, of extras here. This is pretty basic um, instruction. And the interiors, while the intent is to be more residential, like I would I would probably put up a vision of like a college dorm kind of thing. It's not luxurious. It's it's a, just a nicer, uh, more normative places for people to be incarcerated. So it's it's a tricky question. We have put uh, item uh, allowances in the contract so to address escalation in material costs and. Part of working through the process is to, through the RFP process, as well as phase one and phase two of the, of the contract itself, to try and skinny down that cost wherever we can and use materials that are good quality, durable, but not necessarily from five different countries and, and um, a little too absorb exorbitant for our uses. A lot of thought has gone into it. We spent about two and a half years programming it. Uh, we've gone through at least two cost cutting already to try and reduce program space. Uh, we are successful by about 15,000 square feet. So it, it's a continuous process. I don't want to build more than I have to. And a design build team does not want to build more than they have to because that's money out of their pocket. Understood. I think I think it's just to better it's to better understand if, if something does get cut, what can get cut? Because at the end of the day, if we're talking about a facility that's being budgeted today and being built in a couple of years and there's a certain budget, we all know that inflation and the cost of construction continues to rise and it's going to affect the budget in the end. Well, we continue to review the budget and the budget is actually set up to the midpoint of construction. So we've projected out the escalation cost to that midpoint when probably most materials would have been purchased. So we have a pretty good, there's some method to the madness and we have a pretty good uh, sense of what it's gonna cost. Um, and we're working to keep it under that. Thank you, I appreciate the response. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I would just add to that, I think I can speak on behalf of the commission and the department that, you know, it would be most important to us to ensure that the, you know, principles of humane incarceration and the elements of the work you're doing that speak to that continue regardless of what cuts need to be made, as well as the sort of design, um, you know, concerns that our team has has reached. And I know that's all the challenge, but it would just be a reminder that those are the things that would be first and foremost important to us. Um, I understand that okay. someone from MockJ would like to really take um, the chance to answer uh, Commissioner Goodridge's question. Sasha, uh, is that you? No, it's uh, Nadine uh, Molly with MockJ, but Sasha can. Oh, uh, hi. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, okay. yeah. And Sasha's with the Department of um, Corrections, and she can absolutely uh, 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 answer the question as well, um, and maybe in addition. Um, so I just wanted to make note that MockJ. Um, had created a justice implementation task force over the last several years 
Um, and that task force uh, was made up of people that were formerly incarcerated um, and justice advocates. And in the creation of the program and in the development of these uh, facilities, they have absolutely been at the forefront of um, all of the sessions. Um, and specifically, uh, we also uh, reached out to uh, organizations working with women um, on Rikers um, and other uh, groups that are working with people directly impacted um, by the criminal justice system. And so that has been going on um, since 2018, I believe, and Sasha was formerly with MockJ. So maybe Sasha, this might be a good time for you to um, chime in with uh, your experience on the um, the community engagement process. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yes, I was at Mokche as we went through, as we initiated this process and went through the U.R. process, and then I moved over to DOC at the beginning of 2020. Um, and so just to elaborate a little bit more on what Nadine um, already said, we have had a significant amount of engagement with people who have been directly impacted by the criminal justice system, and specifically Rikers Island um, itself. On the justice implementation task force, there are a number of people who, you know, have direct experience either um, from themselves or working within the justice system. And also, more recently, we convened a number of workshops with people who are um, justice involved, and we tried to seek pretty concrete and direct feedback onto some of the design elements in uh, that relate to the interior of the facilities. So about, you know, the finishings, the furniture, you know, some of the layout questions that we had. And so, you know, the voices of the people, you know, who have been impacted by Rikers Island have been included to date. Um, and I think that it is very important, you know, that their voices continue to be reflected as we move forward as well. And if there are any further specific questions about that, I'm happy uh, to answer. I think one, oh, actually, sorry, as I'm talking, there's just one specific um, anecdote that I think really uh, best exemplifies this. We were invited by a um, women's transitional housing organization that helps people who are either being released from jail or prison to uh, re-enter the community and helps them find employment as well. And we were invited to kind of a roundtable discussion at their, you know, the physical site, their transitional housing site. And we went and just kind of talked about the experience of, you know, what it means to um, be incarcerated. And especially many of the women who are incarcerated are also mothers. And one of the suggestions that they made is that we provide uh, dedicated visiting spaces that are private and that feel kind of similar to a living room, to a small living room space that has an area for food preparation and, you know, kind of a low couch, a more comfortable space and a table that is also separate from the rest of the visiting floor. And we were able to incorporate this directly into the program for the facility. And so we have made sure that in all of the facilities, not just where women are housed, there will be this dedicated extended family visiting space. And that was a decision that was made in direct kind of uh, reaction to hearing that suggestion um, from women who were formerly incarcerated. So happy to answer any further questions that people might have. Thank you very much. Um, are there any additional questions from the commission? Okay, well then I thank you all very much for, for coming and sharing with us. Uh, we really appreciate being kept up to date on what's uh, occurring and we look forward to getting the additional information that you referenced. So thanks again. Great. Thank you very much and we'll see you uh, in about six or eight months. Okay. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Um, so the first item on our agenda is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Queens Community District 8. Our presenter is Scott Solomon. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. If you can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So this is a private application by BP Capital Holdings, LLC, proposing a zoning map amendment and corresponding text amendment to facilitate development of an eight-story mixed-use building containing 119 dwelling units, 36 permanently affordable, at 7739 Blade Place in the Kew Garden Hills neighborhood of Queens Community District 8. 
Uh, next slide. The project area is located between the two non-coterminous project areas that comprise the Kew Garden Hills rezoning that was approved in 2019. This community board sponsored application rezoned nearly 42 acres from R2 to R2X, primarily facilitating enlargements of existing single family detached homes. Uh, project area is located a quarter mile northeast of the Kew Gardens interchange, a major junction that provides access to major roads and highways, including Grand Central Parkway, the Van Wyck Expressway, Jackie Robinson Parkway, Queens Boulevard, and Union Turnpike, and also divides the communities of Kew Garden Hills, Kew Gardens to the southwest, Briarwood to the southeast, and Forest Hills to the northwest. Next slide. The surrounding area is predominantly developed with a mix of three-story walk-up apartment buildings to the north, south, and east, mostly within R32 and R4 zoning districts and single-family detached homes to the southwest uh, within the R2X district. The project area is within the R32 district in a C12 commercial overlay that extends to the property immediately to the west. Main Street, uh, located one block east of the project area, serves as the area's primary north-south thoroughfare, and beginning two blocks to the north and south serves as a local shopping corridor where additional C12 overlays are mapped. Uh, Union Turnpike is three blocks to the south and contains additional commercial uses. Community facility uses in the surrounding area include uh, religious and public schools, medical offices, as well as numerous houses of worship. Across the street from the project area is a child care and pre-K facility. Uh, immediately south of the project area is a public park, which includes fields and a children's playground. And the project area is served by several bus lines, including local and select bus service routes that run along Main Street and Union Turnpike. And the Kew Gardens uh, subway station with access to the E and F lines. It's about a 20 minute walk away to the Southwest. Next slide. Uh, the project area consists of approximately 40,000 square feet across block 6630, lot one and a portion of lot 15. Uh, project area is bounded by the Bay Place to the West, 79 foot wide street. 77th Road to the north and 78th Avenue to the south. Development site is located in lot one, corner lot, consisting of approximately 35,000 square feet. Uh, in 2016, a fire destroyed a one-story, uh, fully tenanted commercial building that included 13 local retail businesses. Uh, the site remains vacant, which has left the void of any commercial resources for the immediate area. Uh, and the remaining lot in the project area 15 is a 50,000 square foot interior lot that includes a three-story multifamily apartment building. Uh, however, only a 5,000 square foot triangular portion that contains accessory parking garages is within the rezoning area. Next slide. The area above, uh, looking northeast into the project area, the primary built context are these three-story multifamily buildings in northeast and south. Uh, immediately across from the development site on Blade Place is the pre-K pre facility discussed earlier, and a block east is Main Street with access to bus transit. Uh, in addition to the wider Blade Place, uh, the confluence of the several streets here creates a, a relatively wide intersection, uh, portions over 160 feet wide, uh, which then leads to the immediate south, immediate access to the open space of the public playground to the south. Uh, next slide. So here are uh, photos of the existing conditions. Uh, photo one on the left is a view of the development site facing northeast from the intersection of 78th Avenue and Blade Place. Uh, photo two, looking uh, uh, onto Blade Place, development site on the right, the daycare facility on the left. Next slide. Uh, can we move uh, oh, on? Thank you. Uh, so photo three here on the left is a view of the development site uh, facing southeast from Blade Place. Again, seeing that multifamily uh, context in the background. Photo four uh, is looking into the project again, focus more onto a portion of lot 15, which contains these accessory parking garages. Next slide. Uh, photo five on the left, uh, looking away from the development site towards the open space, what was light and air in the uh, parkland to the south. Uh, and photo six is looking, uh, is a, a view of the south side of 78th Avenue facing southeast from the development site. Again, this multifamily context. Next slide. In terms of the proposed development, the applicant is proposing to build an eight story, 189,000 square foot mixed use building, uh, including the 119 dwelling units and 18,000 square feet of ground floor community facility and commercial space. Uh, following, following the loss of the 13 businesses described earlier, uh, this would bring back a significant amount of lost retail space. Uh, currently proposed is four commercial units and one community facility space. 
Uh, previously, the site was occupied by local retail uses like groceries, dry cleaners, uh, and eating and drinking establishments that primarily cater to the large Orthodox community. Uh, applicant envisions similar local retail uh, in addition to the community facility space, uh, which may contain medical use or even an additional child care facility, uh, which is high demand for the area. Uh, applicant has several meetings with the public who have expressed appetite for either a gym in addition to a uh, uh, favorite of a, another daycare facility. Uh, 36 of the units would be permanently affordable pursuant to MIH option two, although op both options one and two are proposed to be mapped. 126 attended parking spaces would be located in the subcellar and space for 60 bicycles in the cellar. Uh, applicant is also proposing to provide approximately 15,000 square feet of outdoor and interior recreational space uh, beyond the 3,700 square feet required. Uh, and this includes an interior amenity room and terraces on the second, eighth floor and on the roof. Next slide. So this is the uh, luster drawing of the ground floor plan. Uh, there are pedestrian entrances on all frontages, access to parking on 77th Road, loading birth access on 77th Avenue. Uh, Luster of the ground floor plan shows the four ground floor commercial units with access shown in red. Access to the residential lobby is located in the center of the Blade Place frontage and the community facility space located at the corner of Blade Place and 77th Road. Next slide. Uh, second floor uh, illustrative drawing showing additional dwelling units, the interior amenity space, and then access to the second story outdoors terrace. Next slide. This is just an, another illustrative drawing showing the dwelling units located on floors through three through seven. Next slide. Uh, eighth floor plan, additional dwelling units, and the uh, portion of the outdoor recreational space. Next slide. Uh, and the roof plan with additional roof terrace space. Next slide. Above is uh, elevation looking into play place. A proposed building has a maximum height of 85 feet. Next slide. Uh, to facilitate the proposed development, first applicant is proposing a zoning map amendment from an R32 C12 zoning district to R6A C23 and R32. Uh, so essentially in addition to mapping R6A coterminous with lot one, the commercial overlay is being changed to C23 and reduced in depth to only cover lot one. Uh, this would allow for a maximum residential FAR of 3.6 for inclusionary housing areas and three for community facility uses. The C23 overlay would allow commercial FAR of two, reduce commercial parking requirements, and the reduced depth of the overlay would prevent any commercial intrusion further east onto the R32 district. Next slide. Uh, applicant proposes the, uh, a corresponding text amendment. Uh, this is to map MIH coterminously with the rezoning area. Uh, proposed map, again, option one and two, but intended to pursue option uh, two. Uh, this would result in approximately 36 permanently affordable units. Option two requires that at least 30% of the residential floor area be provided as housing permanently affordable to households with incomes at an average of 80% of the area median income, uh, which is 85,000 for a family of three. Uh, for context, the AMI for CD8 is 69,000. Uh, for the sm slightly smaller Two Garden Hills neighborhood tabulation area is 73,000. And for the larger New York City uh, uh, area is 63,000. 60% uh, AMI, uh, for a family of three would be $64,000. Uh, next slide. In conclusion, uh, according to the applicant, the land use rationale relates to bringing much needed housing production, including affordable units to an underlying site that fronts a wide street and is proximate to bus transit. And the commercial overlay would permit a wider range of local and commercial and community facility uses that would serve the surrounding area, uh, reduce owner's parking requirements and reduce the depth of the overlay uh, again, so not to intrude into the uh, mid-block residential character. Uh, concludes the presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott, for that. Um, are there any questions from the commission? Commissioner Romprashad. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, the is the agency's position with the R6A. Are you guys in agreement with this? Because I, I know the area very well. I know this uh, as you showed them from the map. There's a lot of two and three story, one and two family dwellings. I'm just curious. Um, were any other particular zones looked at, like an R5? Uh, well, so th uh, the agency 
uh, provided guidance that our success is consistent with other projects that have provided density on a wide street uh, and proximity to bus transit. So uh, given those variables, we thought that is consistent with other projects. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Okay. Seeing none, I will say this application is certified. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right. Um, the second item on our agenda is a certification of a zoning map amendment in Brooklyn Community District 6. Our presenter is Jonah Rogoff. Here we go. Great. Uh, Jeff, you could start on the next slide. Thank you. Great. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. This is an application by 41 Summit Street LLC for a zoning map amendment from an M11 to an R6B zoning district to facilitate a four story, 5,000 square foot residential development located in the Columbia Street waterfront neighborhood of Brooklyn within Community District 6. Just before discussing the application, some members of the commission may recall in 2019, there was a previous application at 41 Summit Street that initially proposed a higher density R7A district under a larger project area. During Euler, the application was modified by the commission to R6A and then subsequently withdrawn by the applicant during the city council's review. I'll be going into more detail in a, in a moment, uh, but just wanted to immediately flag that the current application reflects a revised proposal by the same applicant with a reduced project area size and a lower scale R6B district in an effort to more closely match the area's built context. Next slide, please. So zooming into the local context with the bird's eye view above, the surrounding area contains a mix of industrial, commercial and residential uses the area to the south and west of the project area, shown in a dashed red line, generally consists of one and two story warehouse buildings with light industrial construction, storage and distribution base uses. Residential uses are concentrated mainly to the east of the project area and generally characterized by two to five story, one and two family homes and multifamily walk up buildings. Columbia Street running north south serves as a mixed use local retail corridor with ground floor commercial and residential above. And then to the west of Van Brunt Street is the Red Hook Container Terminal, an intermodal freight terminal operated by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. With respect to public transit access, the F and G subway lines are located approximately a half a mile from the project area, while the B61 bus line providing access to downtown Brooklyn, Red Hook, and Park Slope stops directly on Columbia Street, just one block southeast of the project area. In addition, I would note a few city bike docking, docking stations are located nearby, along with the entrance to the Hugh L. Carey or Brooklyn Battery Tunnel and BQE. Next slide, please. Above is an area map to help further illustrate the land uses and zoning in the surrounding area. Several properties are owned and operated by the New York City uh, Department of Parks and Recreation, including Mother Cabrini Park, Harold Ickes Playground and Backyard Garden, a community garden located just to the west uh, near the project area. The project area itself, which is nearly coterminous with the development site, is located along a mid-block portion of Summit Street between Van Brunt and Columbia Streets. The blocks between these two streets are typically split between M11 and R6B zoning districts with M11 concentrated on the Western portion of blocks near Van Brun Street. While R6B, a medium density residential district is mapped extensively on the remaining portions of mid blocks and further to the East. M11 is a manufacturing district that allows a maximum of one FAR for industrial and commercial uses and 2.4 FAR for certain community facility uses. The district permits a maximum base height of 30 feet with building height then governed by the sky exposure plane. Accessory off-street parking is generally required for, for every 300 square feet of commercial and for every 1,000 square feet of industrial. 
The surrounding area has also been subject to a number of land use actions, including the 2009 area-wide rezoning of Carroll Gardens and the Columbia Street Waterfront, which mapped, uh, excuse me, which mapped contextual residential districts extensively in, across the neighborhood with the goal of preserving the area's built character and scale. More recently in 2019, a private application at 55-63 Summit Street, located down the block to the east of the project area was approved, which rezoned several lots from M11 to R6B to facilitate a four-story residential building. Next slide, please. And then I just wanna quickly note on the, the flood plain so or flood zone map above that the project area is located just outside the 1% annual chance floodplain and within the 0.2% annual chance floodplain, which is also known as the 500 year floodplain and has a lower risk of coastal flooding. Next slide. Now, just a few images to help walk through the project area and its context. On the left is a view of the development site and the adjacent lots along Summit Street while the image on the right is a close-up view of the site itself. The site occupies 25 feet of frontage on a 2,500 square foot lot that's improved with a two-story former industrial building that's been vacant for several years. Directly to the west of the project area and the site is a two-story uh, Chase Bank. And then to the east is a four-story residential development. Next slide. And for additional context, on the left is a view of Summit Street facing northwest with Harold Ickes playground visible further in the distance. And then on the right is a view of Summit Street facing southeast. Next slide, please. The applicant proposes a four story, 5,000 square foot residential development totaling two FAR and consisting of four total dwelling units with a building height of 40 feet and no setback. No parking spaces are being proposed as the development would waive out of the off-street parking requirement. Next slide. To facilitate the proposal, the applicant requests a zoning map amendment from an M11 to an R6B zoning district, which would extend an existing R6B district over the development site and a very small sliver portion of the adjacent lot. R6B is a contextual residential district that allows a maximum of two FAR for residential and community facility uses, base heights between 30 and 40 feet, and building heights up to a maximum of 50 feet or 55 feet for the qualifying ground floor. Off-street parking is required for 50% of the total dwelling units or market rate units and waived if five or fewer spaces are required. Before concluding, I want to just note that the applicant is not requesting a zoning text amendment to map a mandatory inclusionary housing area. As the increase in residential density from the zoning map amendment action is very limited and would result in development far below the threshold to comply with MIH. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jonah for that. Um, are there questions from the commission? Well, seeing none, Jonah, I will say this uh, certified. Thank you. Thank you. The third item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendments in Brooklyn Community District 5. Our presenter is Karina Liang. Karina, there we go. Do we have Karina here? A private application for- oh, There we go. Yeah, can you, can you hear me? You're a little, you're a little faint. Um, this is a private. There, how about that? Um, okay, so this is a private application for a rezoning with MIH to facilitate the development of a six-story mixed-use building. Next slide.
The project is located in the East New York neighborhood of Brooklyn Community District 5 near the Brooklyn Queens border. Next slide. actions would facilitate a, a six-story mixed-use building totaling about 32,000 square feet. The building would have approximately 28 dwelling units with an estimated eight of these uh, to be MIH units and then additional 10 accessory parking spaces located below grade as well as seven, about 7,000 square feet of ground floor commercial space. Next slide. To facilitate the development, the applicant is seeking a rezoning along Sutter Avenue from R5 to R6A with a C24 overlay. Next slide. The applicant's also proposing to map both options one and two in the MIH area. Next slide. The community board uh, did not hold a vote, but they, um, the, the Land Use Committee is meeting tonight and they may be bringing it to a vote next Wednesday. The borough president uh, held a vote on December 30th and uh, approved the application on the conditions that the, um, the applicant limit the rezoning area to the eastern half of the block front, so um, it would cover only the development site. Um, and then another condition that the applicant only map option one and not option two. And then on the condition that the that city council obtain written commitments from the applicant um, for things such as permanent affordability, um, putting more large units in the mix, and then incorporating green building materials and site improvements. Um, and with that, I'll take uh, any questions. Thank you. Karina, uh, are there any questions for Karina? Commissioner Levin. Um, yeah, not so much a question, but a preview of a question I'll have for the applicant um, tomorrow. And that is um, about their choice of using option two. Um, whereas I think as Commissioner Knuckles indicated when this was um, certified, option one would seem to better meet the um, area's needs. And I guess that's echoed in the borough president's recommendation. So if they could talk to us a little bit about their um, affordability choices here. Um, and also if they could fill us in on the out parcels, um, the half of the block front that is proposed to be rezoned, but is not part of the development site. I noticed that the building on the corner, uh, the site on the corner is a projected development site. And those out parcels have a total of, um, I think it's six um, dwelling units between them. So we need to be careful about the impact that this may have on those units. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, the applicant will definitely speak to their choice about MIH option two and um, can also discuss the out parcels. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. Um, if the applicant could also speak to the um, rationale for the commercial overlay at this location um, and their vision for uh, the ground floor uses at the site. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I will also ask them to further discuss that. Um, I do want to reiterate that the oh. office um, does support the um, commercial overlay here just because the area is, there, there are a lot of um, residential units in the immediate area, um, especially with the Linden, um, Linden Plaza development to the south, and the area is very um, under retailed. Um, the applicant is looking to put in some neighborhood the local retail, um, but they can also speak further to that. Okay, where, and actually as a follow-up, then where is sort of the nearest neighborhood serving retail? Um, it's hard to tell from the map. Um, yeah, Pitkin Ave, um, there, there really isn't much in the area. Um, there is some retail 
along Conduit, kind of like further south off of Linden, but the Pekin Ave to the north, a couple of blocks, and then further west is the closest neighborhood retail or like large um, kind of neighborhood retail corridor. Okay, so and if you're thinking about a no, a no if I could add to that, there's also the supermarket. Sorry, I just wanted to add that there was a, a supermarket within the Linden Plaza development itself, um, which uh, is Caddy Corner, uh, southeast of the proposed project site. Um, and uh, and that serves uh, both residents of Linden Plaza and those. So then no grocery store here, because there's already one across the street or Caddy Corner, as you said. Okay, no. So we're essentially creating a new commercial district um, in a place where we feel it's needed. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there are existing commercial uses, you know, long-standing commercial uses on the site as well, along Sutter, Sutter Ave. Um, further west, you know, there are a lot more commercial uses. It just kind of like peters out as you um, kind of get towards Conduit Ave. I think, you know, the only thing I would say is, is thinking about um, supporting concentration of retail activity as opposed to scattering it again. So, you know, if that's the vision for this location, um, you know, perhaps writing that into the report. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Ortiz. Are there any other questions or comments on this from the commission? Okay. All right, well, this will be on for public hearing tomorrow, January 19th. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, the fourth item on our agenda is a post-referral review of a non-Euler CPC certification in Manhattan, Community District 11. Jose Trucios is our presenter, Jose. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. Um, this is a third follow-up certification related to the 2017 approved actions uh, to facilitate the development of a new mixed-use building and a new home of the, uh, for the National Black Theater. Next slide, please. A private application by 2033 National Black Theater Way at LC for a certification by the City Planning Commission pursuant to Sony Resolution Section 9755 to allow the location of an enclosed loading bird to be located closer to a residential district boundary than otherwise permitted. The action will allow the applicant to continue to move forward with the plan bill out year by 2024. Next slide. The proposed development is located at 2031st Fifth Avenue in East Harlem Borough of Manhattan, Community District 11, within the Subdistrict 8 of the Special 125th Street District and the Special Transit Land Use District. Zoned as a C47 district, it includes Block 1750 and Lot 1, bounded by East 126th Street to the north, south of 125th Street, Fifth Avenue to the west, and Madison to the east. Lot one has a an area, um, lot area approximately of 17,000 square feet and then occupies the entire frontage of Fifth Avenue, which is approximately 200 feet. Um, and approximately 885 um, feet of frontage in East 125th and East 126th Street. The surrounding area is very well served by mass transportation, which the commission recognized in granting the special permit to reduce parking requirements under section um, 74533 of the Sonar Resolution in 2017. Next slide. Here are some photos of the surrounding area. In generally, uh, in general, low-rise buildings are located within the mid-blocks of the side streets, and mid-rise buildings are located along the block, block fronts of avenues on 125th Street. Um, community facilities, including houses of worship, public schools, and community parks, like the 20 acre Marcos Garvey Park, located one block south of the development site, are dispersed throughout the surrounding area. Next slide. 
125th district is predominantly commercial corridor characterized by a variety of building uses and heights within intervals of higher density developments. Next slide. The actions approved in 2017 include a rezoning of the site from a C4A district to a C47 district, a tax amendment to establish a new sub-district with the special 125th Street District, and to designate the site as an MIH area, as well as a special permit to weigh parking spaces. On August 2016 or last year, the MTA and the CPC determined that a transit easement volume will not be required for the site, releasing the owner from any obligation to provide transit easement um, on the on this for this project. A, re a related application has also been filed for a chair certification for visual or performing arts, the VPA bonus, uh, under section 97.423 of the Sonar Resolution, which is a chair certification. Next slide, please. Um, the proposed building will contain approximately 203,000 square footage of floor area, equal to 11.97 FAR, including over 152,000 of residential, 27,000 of commercial, retail and service, and 27,000 community facil facility space for the theater. It will stand at 21 stories, 245 feet, with a 73 feet base, 15 feet setbacks along 125th Street, and 10 feet setbacks along 5th Avenue and 125th Street. Approximately 200 residential units will be located on the 5th to 21st floors. Of the 200 residential units, approximately 53 units will comply with the MIH-1 auction one for affordability requirements. A loading barrier is required as a result of the aggregate commercial use exceeding 25,000 square feet. Next slide. Um, here is the Sony section 9755, and I will go into the details of the actual uh, findings. Next slide, please. The special 125th district prohibit car cuts along 125th street and other wide streets, including 5th Avenue. Thus, no allowing the applicant to meet section 9753 location to access to the street. Additional per uh, section 36683, restrictions on loading bears near residential districts. The underlying regulations state the accessory loading bears must be enclosed within 60 feet of residential district boundaries. And the ingress and egress for loading bears must be at least 30 feet away from the residential boundary. The proposed loading bear on the north facade along 126th Street is 10.4 uh, feet west of the R68 district. The location is 19.6 feet closer to what is permitted as a right. <clears throat> um, that and that that um, relates to finding eight, which is the only possible location for the facility of the loading bird. Regarding no uh, finding B, no hazards to traffic and safety, um, the MBT use of the loading bird will be infrequent and limited to pre and post performance setup and strike which will minimize the interaction to any traffic on 126th Street and any traffic safety concerns associated with frequent truck traffic. The 2017 environmental assessment included um, an analysis and concluded that there was no significant traffic impacts. Next slide, please. For, uh, for finding C, located no less than 50 feet from the intersection of any two streets lines, the proposed loading bear is located 62.6 .6 feet beyond the intersection of 5th Avenue and 20, 125th Street. Um, finding D, constructed and maintained so as to have a minimal effect on the streetscape. The exterior of the proposed loading dock will be constructed with materials similar to other portions of the proposed building's podium. The architectural treatment and facade expression of 125th Street facade will incorporate the loading bear in a holistic manner. Uh, finding C, such a car cap, if it's granted, should be not greater than 20 feet in width. And lastly, the proposed car cap is 17 feet wide, including its place. Next slide. As a result of the wide street car cap provisions on 125th Street District and the restraints imposed by the proximity of the resident district boundary on the only narrow street frontage of the development site, the applicant seeks a certification for access to the enclosed a commercial loading bird. With that, I can answer questions and thank you for your time.
Thanks very much, Jose. Uh, are there questions from the commission about this uh, CPC certification? Commissioner Levin. Um, yeah, two questions. One is whether this loading berth was part of the plan when it went through ULERP. Is this, how, did, how do we get to doing this certification now? And the second question is um, where resident, you indicated this is just for the um, commercial space. Um, where will residential loading take place? Uh, for the first question, uh, when this 2017 actions was appro were approved, the commercial square footage was still in flux and did not exceed uh. the 5,000 square footage uh, threshold. Um, and, and that's why they are now seeking this okay. information. Uh, for the second question, if I, if we can go back to slide, I believe it's nine. Um, there is a, an entrance in um, 120, if I believe it's Fifth Avenue for the, uh, for the residential space. Um, but I just wanted to know that this will be only for the use of the National Black Theater, commercial uh, loading for the frontage of the, of the proposed building uses will be on Fifth Avenue as well. So this will so, be only for the, for the MBT use. Okay, so, so street, street loading for the Fifth mm -hmm. Avenue frontage. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bernie. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I just had one quick follow up here, and that is that um, when they are loading and unloading, if they're bringing in scenery and, uh, and artifacts and so on, uh, hopefully DOT will give them um, access on the street front and not allow parking on that stretch. Because if you come up with your truck full of scenery and then everybody's parking there, then you end up double parking and it's a whole mess. So hopefully DOT can be prevailed upon to give them a, a space over there. At the moment, 126 Street uh, does not allow parking on the site. So I think oh. that, that, that's being covered by them. So uh, that, I believe that makes the uh, location a lot more uh, yeah. proper for those loading oh. berths. Terrific. Thank you. Commissioner Eady. You're on mute, Commissioner Eady. Apologies. Um, given that there's a theater there mm -hmm. now, is this the location of a, the prior where they would load in material previously, or is this a different location? Do we know? This is a different location. Previously, uh, the entrance was on Fifth Avenue for, for all materials loading on that. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, can can I get an assent by a show of hands to send an approval letter to the Department of Buildings? Um, please, if, if you're comfortable with this, please say yay and raise your hand. Yay. 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 Uh, any opposed? Say nay. Raise your hand. Okay, then the A's carry. So we're going to send this letter to the Department of Buildings. Thanks very much, Jose. Thank you. The fifth item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a UDAP designation, uh, disposition site selection, uh, and, and disposition of city-owned property in Manhattan Community District 6. Our presenter is Askin Mohidin. <clears throat> Good afternoon, commissioners. This application is filed by the New York State Department of Housing Preservation and Development and the Department of Homeless Services to facilitate an as of right building that will house a women's shelter, supportive and affordable housing and a medical clinic. The site is located at 215-225 East 45th Street in the East Midtown neighborhood of Manhattan Community District 6. The application was certified on November 1st, 2021 and is coming back to the commission for a public hearing on Wednesday. Next slide, please. 215-225 East 45th Street is located on the block bound by East 46th Street to the north, 2nd Avenue to the east, East 45th Street to the south, and 3rd Avenue to the west. The surrounding area is characterized by high-density commercial office buildings with ground floor retail uses to the west and transitions to more residential uses to the east towards 2nd Avenue. 
The development site is mapped with C64 and C53 zone districts. A portion of the site is also within the East Midtown subdistrict of the Special Midtown District. The area is served by Grand Central Station, located approximately three blocks to the east, providing access to the four, five, six, seven, and shuttle subway lines, as well as the major terminus of the Metro North Railroad. Next slide, please. The requested actions will enable an as of right development, which is expected to be a 217 foot tall building comprising 117,000 zoning square feet or 11.78 FAR. Approximately 34,000 square feet will be dedicated to a purpose built shelter space, expanding the existing 130 shelter beds to provide approximately 171 beds for single adult women. Shelter amenities would include kitchen areas, dining areas, and laundry rooms. Approximately 79,600 square feet would, be, would support 130 affordable housing units plus a superintendent's unit. Of those 130 studio units, 79 would be supportive housing for formerly homeless individuals and 51 would be for other low-income individuals and households earning up to 60% of the area median unit income, which amounts to $50,160 for a one-person household. A shared outdoor terrace on the second floor would be available for both affordable housing and shelter residents. A medical clinic serving both shelter residents and the public would occupy 3,600 square feet on the ground floor. Project Renewal is the operator of the existing shelter on the site and is expected to operate the expanded shelter in the future. Project Renewal currently operates 23 housing programs serving over 2,000 individuals a day throughout the city. These programs include crisis services, specialized shelters, transitional housing, supportive housing, and affordable housing. Next slide, please. The applicant is requesting two actions from the City Planning Commission to facilitate the as of right development shown illustratively on the right. The first is an urban development action area project designation and approval pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Disposition of City-Owned Property. Second is a site selection pursuant to Section 197C of the New York City Charter to remove an existing capacity restriction of 150 shelter beds on the site imposed by the previous site selection in 1993. Next slide, please. On December 8th, 2021, Community Board 6 voted with 39 votes in favor, zero opposed, and two abstaining to approve the application. On December 21st, 2021, the Borough President recommended approval of the application with conditions. These conditions include that the applicant agree to market available units in coordination with local Midtown organizations and prioritize Midtown residents as potential tenants. In response, the applicant has confirmed that the 51 affordable housing units will comply with the HPD and HDC marketing guideline, which currently allows for a 50% community preference for market units. For the 79 supportive housing units, referrals will be accepted from HRA and DHS directly. Next slide, please. In summary, the applicant is requesting a UDAP designation, approval, and disposition of city-owned property and a new site selection to remove the capacity limit on the existing shelter use. The two actions will enable the as of right development of a 21-story building, which will house a women's shelter, supportive and affordable housing, and a medical clinic. I'm happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Asuka. Um, are there any questions from the commission? Commission. Commissioner Edie. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, I don't that know. was from before. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, yes. Vice Chair Knuckles. Vice Chair Knuckles. I, I just wanted to uh, uh, to uh, clarify of the the 130 units. Are they all permanent housing, or is a portion, uh, i.e., the 79 supportive use uh, supportive units, are those transient? or uh, would the occupants uh, have permanent housing once, uh, once occupying the facility? Um, I believe the supportive housing is transient, um, but uh, the applicant confirmed that tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Okay, seeing none, this is on for hearing tomorrow. Thanks again, Oscar.
The sixth item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a notice of intent to inquire office space in Manhattan Community District 1. Uh, presenting for the first time to the commission is Jasmine DePaul. Jasmine? Jasmine, you are muted. If you're trying to talk, I can see you, but I cannot. Can you hear me now? Oh, there we go. Okay. Apologies. It, the Zoom just unexpectedly quit on me. It does that. <laughs> go ahead. So good afternoon, commissioners. This is a notice of intent to acquire office space by the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services, or DCAS and the New York uh, Police Department, or NYPD. This is pursuant to Section 195 of the New York City Charter and will facilitate the acquisition of office spaces at 27 Cliff Street. So additionally, the NYPD is seeking to park up to 10 vehicles at 80 John Street. Uh, both sites are located in Lower Manhattan in Community District 1. The office and parking spaces will be used by NYPD's World Trade Center Command. The WTCC is responsible for public safety, law enforcement, and security activities on the 16-acre World Trade Center campus. They work jointly with the Port Authority Police Department of New York and New Jersey, as outlined in the World Trade Center Strategic Security Plan. Next slide. The proposed NYPD office space is located at 27 Cliff Street and is generally bound by Fulton Street to the north, Gold Street to the west, and John Street to the south. The law is mapped on the C6-4 district. The entrance to the proposed NYPD parking facility is located on Platt Street and is bound by John Street to the north, Gold Street to the east, and William Street to the west. This, um, this law is mapped on a C5-5 district. Both sites are located in the Lower Manhattan Special District, and the surrounding area is characterized by a dense mix of commercial and residential buildings, and there are also several mixed-use buildings and institutional uses. Next slide, please. Currently, the NYPD's World Trade Center Command occupies space within the NYPD's first precinct station house at 19 Barrack Street, which also houses several other units. Since the WTCC's inception in 2011, the unit has nearly tripled in size and has outgrown the current approximate 23,300 square feet space that it shares with the first precinct and other units. The first precinct and its operations will remain at 19 Derrick Street once the WTCC is able to relocate. Next slide. The relocation will place the WTCC about 2,000 feet from the World Trade Center campus, which encompasses One World Trade, Three World Trade, Four World Trade, the 9-11 Museum, Memorial Plaza, Liberty Park, the Ronald O. Perlman Performing Arts Center, the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church, and the Brookfield Properties. This area is well served by public transit, the ACJZ, Two, three, four, and five subway lines can be accessed at the Fulton Street Station and are all within a few blocks of both buildings. There are several bus lines in the area, including the M15, QM11, and QM25, as well as the free downtown connection bus. Additionally, there is a ferry service from Pier 11 and the Staten Island Ferry nearby. The area is also accessible by the Brooklyn Bridge, Manhattan Bridge, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, and the Holland Tunnels. DCAS has been trying to find a suitable relocation space for a number of years as identified in the citywide statement of needs for fiscal year 2019 through 2020. Next slide. The existing building on 27 Cliff Street is a five-story, approximately 21,520 square feet commercial and office building. The NYPD proposes to occupy all the approximately 20,597 square feet of office space located on the second through fifth floor. It will accommodate approximately 165 NYPD personnel. There will also be a dedicated entrance for NYPD personnel from Cliff Street with access to a private staircase and private elevator to the office area. 
There is an existing retail tenant on the ground floor of 27 Cliff Street, which has a dedicated entrance for their customers separate from the NYPD personnel entrance. Next slide. The parking facility for NYPD use is located at 80 John Street in a 26 story, approximately 150,000 square feet mixed residential and commercial building. The NYPD proposes to park approximately 10 NYPD vehicles at the condos parking facility located on Platt Street. The proposed accessory parking location is within a few blocks from the proposed office space located at 27 Cliff Street. Next slide. The space at 27 Cliff Street is currently vacant and will be renovated to include a muster room, a conference room, locker rooms, administrative offices, pantry, body-worn camera room, and a armory, restrooms, and a break area for staff. The office space will be occupied by the NYPD 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This space will not receive members of the public and there will be no overnight lodging or holding cells. Next slide. The parking garage is approximately 6,362 square feet. NYPD will occupy all the parking space, but will share the parking garage with the existing condo, which uses the parking garage for move-ins, move-outs, ADA accessibility, and receiving deliveries for the tenants. The parking space will be occupied by the NYPD 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Next slide. On December 21st, 2021, Community Board 1 voted 39 in favor of the DCAS and NYPD application to acquire office spaces and parking in their community district. There were zero opposed and one recused. The Community Board views the NYPD office relocation as an asset to the community. However, they had concerns about NYPD vehicles parking at 80 John Street. Their approval is conditional in that NYPD ensures that they keep a harmonious relationship with the residents who use the parking garage and with the neighboring residential buildings. Next slide. In summary, the applicant is requesting a PX action notice of intent to acquire office space pursuant to section 195 of the New York City Charter to facilitate the relocation of NYPD offices currently located at 19 Barrack Street. Additionally, they're seeking up to 10 parking spaces at 80 John Street to park NYPD vehicles. This project is set to be heard for public hearing uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, January 19th. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jasmine. Are there any, any questions or comments from the commission? Okay, well, thank you for that presentation so this will be on for hearing tomorrow thank you the seventh item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a business improvement district in manhattan community district two our presenter is douglas rose Hi, Commissioners. I hope everyone's safe and well. My name is Doug Rose. I'm a senior planner at DCP's Economic Development Division. And this is a pre-hearing review session to establish a West Village Business Improvement District. The applicant is New York City Department of Small Business Services on behalf of the proposed Business Improvement District Steering Committee. Next slide, please. The proposed bid is located in Manhattan's Greenwich Village Historic District and is centered around 7th Avenue South and Christopher Street as outlined in orange on the map. The bid area is roughly seven blocks long and two avenues wide. This mixed use neighborhood is culturally rich, commercially vibrant with high foot traffic and excellent transit access. Approximately two thirds of properties in the proposed bid area are partially or wholly commercial and the remaining third is purely residential. Most businesses in the area tend to occupy smaller footprint, single story retail with residential above. The area does not currently have a bid, but there are existing bids nearby. The proposed bid stated goal is to create, quote, clean, beautiful and safe streets with fewer vacancies, better managed foot traffic and more resident engagement, end quote. Next slide, please. This slide covers the services provided by the bid, along with its budget and funding model. Services provided by the bid could include street cleaning above and beyond what is already offered by the city, 
plus beautification projects such as tree pit maintenance and holiday lighting. The bid would also run some community orientated marketing and promotion campaigns and also coordinate and advocate on behalf of the bid's residences and businesses. With regards to budget, the bid's estimated first year annual budget is approximately $600,000. With regards to funding, the bid is funded through payments made by property owners within the bid boundary. In the first year, it's estimated that 90% of funding will come from commercial and mixed use property owners and 10% from residential property owners. For commercial and mixed use properties, their financial contribution will be based on the size and width of their building. Specifically, commercial and mixed use properties would pay annually $18 per linear front foot, plus 42 cents for every square foot of commercial space. This works out to be around $1,300 per year for the medium commercial property. Purely residential property tax lots will pay a $100 annual fee and property devoted solely to public or not-for-profit use are exempt from payment. Next slide, please. This slide addresses the public outreach and support for the bid. This bid application was led by a steering committee of local community stakeholders who contacted property owners, local businesses, and residents in a multi-year process. Outreach efforts included two public meetings, at least seven steering committee meetings, distribution of four mailers to all property owners, two mailers to all residents, and two mailers to all businesses, and extensive emails and in-person meetings with interested parties. The bid had strong support from those who voiced their opinion via a survey sent to all properties in the area. 50% of the commercial assessed value within the bid area supported the bid's formation and 1% were unsupportive. The overall response rate was 51%, but these statistics mean 98% of property commercial property owners who voiced an opinion were in support of the proposal. On the residential side, 11% of Residential property owners support the bids formation and 1% were unsupportive. The overall response rate was 12%, but these statistics mean 94% of residents who voiced an opinion were in support of the bids creation. Community Board 2 was strongly in favour of the proposal, with 36 members in favour and only one opposed. Next slide, please. That concludes the presentation for the proposal to create a West Village Business Improvement District. There'll be a public hearing tomorrow. Thank you for listening and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Doug. Commissioner Good. I just have a purely technical question because um, I'm trying to just make sure I don't, I, I have it right. So when you say, for example, 50% of commercial um, owners in uh, approved of it, but then 1% opposed, what is the other 49%? Uh, they were unresponsive. Or may maybe I have it wrong. No, that, that, that's correct. And the remaining gap are just people who didn't respond to the survey. Oh, okay. okay, okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Levin. Uh, yes, thank you. This is a little bit of an unusual bid in that we have a higher um, contribution from residential properties. Typically, you know, you see a dollar, a token, because the whole idea is that you don't really tax residential properties here. But I understand the background, um, which is that um, the neighborhood residents really feel they need these services. And I certainly understand that having passed through that neck of the woods. Um, the community board's um, recommendation um, uh, re includes a recommendation that board members include both residential property owners and renters. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the bid board will be um, assembled and whether that condition will be fulfilled? Yes, I can. Thank you, Commissioner. So once... Assuming this process goes well and um, you know, city council and the state controller approve of this bid, uh, a district management association would be created uh, to run the bid and, and that association will have a board of directors. And you know, the association has some latitude to create 
an organizational structure that best suits their needs. Um, but there are specific requirements regulated by SBS. And one of those is to ensure residential representation. And I mean, the reality is that often the board is full of people who live in the district because it's quite a kind of local thing. So um, there will definitely be at least one residential tenant um, on the like guarantee of a renter versus a property owner. Like I can't speak to that, but SBS, um, can provide more commentary on that tomorrow, yeah. as well as I think the steering committee for the bid will also be joining. Um, yeah, I'm, I assume they can give some color to this this issue and that would be welcome. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bernie. Yeah, just to sort of continue that conversation. Uh, as I recall, the uh, composition of the board is bound by New York State bid statute. Um, and that's to say you need a majority of property owners, at least one commercial tenant, one residential tenant for whatever they call class D elected reps and so on and so forth. So in order to expand the board beyond the statute, I think you'd have to go back to the state is my understanding. I, everything you said there is true, but I think that doesn't preclude there being a renter on the board. Yeah, but not, if you wanted 50% of the board to be renters, for example, you wouldn't be able to do that really without going back to the state statute, yes? Yes, that's correct. So there are some constraints to what you can actually... Yeah, it can't be... The board needs to be majority property owners. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. But as I read the community board's recommendation, it doesn't really quite go that far. They just want to be sure that there are both residential property owners and residential tenants. And I think you could do that within the confines of the state law. Hi, hi, it's Barry Dinstein. Um, if I can just jump in here. Yes, the, the statute sort of sets a, a proportion, but generally with uh, bids like this, um, you know, they're just looking for volunteers and they try and get as many people to participate as they can. And so if there's a group of residents, be they owners or tenants, and they want to work on the board, um, uh, generally the bid is very happy to accommodate them. So um, it's generally a problem to get enough people to sort of work on it, as opposed to trying to exclude people. So um, you know, if there are residents who are interested, it's very likely that um, they will be on the board and very much welcomed. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Goodridge, you have another question? Oh, okay. I see your hand up. Okay. Are there any additional questions from the commission? All right. Well, this will be on for hearing tomorrow and the SBS uh, folks will be here. Thank you. Okay. The eighth item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a business improvement district expansion in Queens Community District 12. Uh, Doug will present this one as well. Great, thank you. Back again, this one is a little bit more complicated. Um, so this is a pre-hearing review session to amend the district plan for the Suffern Boulevard Business Improvement District. Next slide, please. The applicant is New York City Department of Small Business Services, SBS. The project area is in downtown Jamaica, Queens. And the action requested is a recommendation on amending the district plan for the Suffern Boulevard bid. Uh, before I go any further, I also wanted to give just some quick definitions. So we're all on the same page. A business improvement district, a bid, is de a defined area in which property owners financially contribute in order to fund additional services and projects within the bid area. A special area district, a SAD, is a precursor legal structure to a bid. In New York City, the SAD structure was superseded by the bid structure in 1982 giving more control to the city and the city council on this policy area. The SAD structure is fairly outdated legal structure and outside of downtown Jamaica, there is only one SAD left in New York City. Next slide, please. So this slide gives an overview of the proposal. 
Currently, there are three smaller directly adjacent bids and SADs in downtown Jamaica area of Queens. And this proposal seeks to replace those three entities with a single larger bid. The primary rationale being a single larger bid can deliver you know, better outcomes for residents and businesses by providing a more effective and uniform approach and just kind of economies of scale in service delivery. The second rationale is the one to move away from the outdated SAD model to a purely bid model for downtown Jamaica. The bid model has better governance controls, plus clearer and more sustainable legal obligations. So this is important because SADs are much more vulnerable to trip and fall lawsuits um, because one of their original goals from the 1970s, which turned out to be financially unrealistic, was to help maintain the streetscapes around downtown Jamaica. The result is these SADs end up using too much of their budget on insurance premiums instead of direct services that actually benefit residents and businesses. So by adopting the now standard bid structure, those insurance issues can be avoided. So SBS's overall vision is to move from three smaller bids and SADs to one larger, more efficient and effective bid for downtown Jamaica. Next slide, please. Before examining the proposal in more detail, I wanted to give you an overview of the geography and existing conditions. So downtown Jamaica, Queens is a major transit hub, multiple subway lines, the air train to JFK airport, the Long Island Railroad Jamaica station, but is also you know, a vibrant center for arts, culture and commerce. You know, it's characterized by a mixture of commercial and retail and some residential uses. There is a relatively wide range of building heights and a mixture of national and local retailers. Um, it's a significant shopping destination for many people. Today, downtown Jamaica is served by three directly adjacent bids or SADs. Firstly, Suffern Boulevard bid shown in blue on the map, which is found on the Western end of downtown Jamaica and is centered around a half mile stretch of Suffern Boulevard between Hillside Avenue and 94th Avenue. Jamaica Long Island Railroad Station and Rail Yard are also included in that bid boundary. The second entity is the Jamaica SAD, Jamaica Centre SAD, shown in green on the map, which runs along Jamaica Avenue between Southern Boulevard and 170th Street. And finally, the third entity is the 165th Street Mall SAD, shown in yellow on the map, which operates along 165th Street between Jamaica Ave and 89th Avenue. Next slide, please. So SBS's overall objective is to have a single unified bid for downtown Jamaica. The, the legal mechanism for achieving that objective is to amend the district plan for the Suffern Boulevard bid in three main ways. So firstly, to expand the Suffern Boulevard bid boundary to encompass properties currently in the 165th Street Mall SAD and the Jamaica Center SAD. Second is to rename the bid from Suffern Boulevard bid to downtown Jamaica bid. And thirdly, update the assessment formula to ensure uniformity in how property payments to the bid are determined. I will cover each of these in more detail in the following slides. But before I do, I also wanted to mention the reason these amendments are focused on Suffern Boulevard bid is because Suffern Boulevard bid already has the desired and now standard bid structure whereas the other two entities have the old SAD structure. Additionally, if this, proposal was, if this proposal was approved, a new governance and management structure to run this bid would also be established by the local community in coordination with SBS. Next slide, please. So the first change is to expand the Suffern Boulevard bid boundary to encompass properties currently in the 165th Street Mall SAD and the Jamaica Center SAD. So the light blue bid area in the left panel would be expanded to cover the dark blue area in the right hand panel. The 165th Street SAD and Jamaica Center SAD shown in green and yellow would be dissolved by parallel city council legislation, leaving just one large bid in downtown Jamaica. As you can see from the map, 
there are not any new properties involved. And what I mean by that is that if your property is currently assessed by a bid or a SAD, it would remain assessed. And if your property is currently outside of a bid or a SAD area, it would remain outside. Next slide, please. So second change, pretty straightforward, is just to rename the bid. It's currently called Sutton Boulevard bid, and under this proposal will be renamed the Downtown Jamaica bid to better reflect the expanded geography it will serve. Next slide, please. The third main change is that the formula used to calculate property owner contributions to the bid would be altered. So the new assessment formula would mean commercial and mixed use properties would pay proportional to their width and assess value of their property, meaning wider and more valuable properties will pay more than less and smaller and less valuable properties. This differs from the current formula for Southern Boulevard bid and 165th Street Mall Sad, which are purely based on property width. The proposed formula is in line with best practice and is similar to the Jamaica Center SAD formula. So to recap on this slide, the new formula would mean properties pay based on how wide their property is, but also how valuable it is. Whereas the existing formula is just based on building width. Next slide, please. So this slide covers the services the expanded bid might provide along with detail on budget and funding model. So services provided by the bid could include street cleaning and beautification projects such as tree pit maintenance and holiday lighting above and beyond what is already offered by the city. The bid might also run some marketing and promotion campaigns and coordinate and advocate on behalf of the bid's residences and businesses. With regards to budget, the bid's estimated first year annual budget is approximately $1.35 million, with the option to increase the assessed assessment budget to $1.5 million in future years. With regards to funding, the bid is funded through payments made by property owners within the bid boundary. For commercial and mixed-use properties, their financial contribution will be based on the width and value of their property, as mentioned on the previous slide. Specifically, commercial and mixed-use properties would pay annually $61 per linear front foot, plus 2.2 of a cent for every dollar of assessed value. This works out to be about $3,800 per year for the medium commercial property, which is 9% less than what the medium property would contribute under the existing model. So this will be cheaper for property owners. Purely residential property tax lots will pay a nominal $1 annual fee. Property devoted solely to public or not-for-profit use are exempt from payments. Next slide, please. This slide provides some more detail around the support for bid unification. So in 2014 and 2015, the Mayor's Office, DCP, EDC, and Queen, the Queen's Borough President's Office led a Jamaica planning initiative to engage stakeholders and develop an economic development strategy for downtown Jamaica. This nine month initiative included over 30 meetings with community stakeholders and resulted in the Jamaica Now Action Plan, which identified 21 strategic initiatives, one of which was to unify these three downtown bids and SADs to strengthen their marketing and programs and service delivery. Between 2015, in 2017, efforts were made to develop a bid unification strategy, including setting up a unification committee, which had representatives from all three bids and SADs, and funding to assess different governance models. However, unification efforts were temporarily paused after a lack of consensus. Bid unification efforts were restarted in 2021, gaining support from the borough president, outgoing council member Miller, incoming council member Williams and the Greater Jamaica Development Corporation. And in 2021, SBS re-engaged existing bids and SADs about unification. The community board met in December 2021, so last month, to discuss this proposal. 19 members of Queen's Community Board 12 opposed this action and 12 members were in favour. The community board noted some existing bid leaders were in support and some bid leaders were in opposition and the community board felt all existing bid leaders should be in support before unifying the bids. Next slide, please. 
That concludes the presentation. There'll be a public hearing tomorrow, which will include a presentation from the applicant, New York City Department of Small Business Services. Uh, thank you for listening and happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Doug. Are there questions from the commission about this one? Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. Um, yes, I have a number of questions, maybe, maybe some for tomorrow, but I will flag them. Um, in the footnotes, um, and you mentioned it here, you talked about the insurance premiums, um, and you said they would go away. Uh, what are the insurance premiums? And is the unification, does the unification then eliminate those premiums. So what kinds of savings are we talking about um, here? Do you have that information? Yeah, so um, I think SPS a better place to answer those questions in more detail. I can give you a broad overview, which is yes, those insurance premiums will be significantly reduced. So the Jamaica Center SAD right now pays over $200,000 a year in insurance premiums. And those insurance premiums are pre predominantly related to trip and the threat of trip and fall lawsuits, um, which kind of goes back to the origin of the goals of these SADs in the 70s. Um, and so this will reduce those premiums signif significantly. So for example, the Suffern Boulevard bid, which has the kind of desire desired and now standard bid structure, their insurance premiums are only $8,000 a year. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea of the savings. Um, and then I think at the end, you had a more general question about savings, which is insurance premiums are not the only saving available here. I think just kind of merging three uh, contracts and organizations just allows for some efficiency um, in contracting costs. Yeah, I think some of the documentation I did an assessment about 123,000 administrative savings. And then along with what seems like at least, you know, 180,000 of, of insurance premiums. So that's really, really significant. And then the second piece, um, you mentioned that there, as a result, I guess, of some of those savings and the potential to reallocate towards services, right? We always, the gold standard is services, not paying for overhead. Um, you said there would be a decrease of about 9% in, um, you know, the, the average uh, assessment? Yes. So um, based on the calculations that SBS has done, um, they're saying that this is going to be cheaper for the average property owner. So um, we're hoping for lots of wins here where, you know, standard of delivery of services will maintain be maintained or even improved but also it will cost property owners less um yeah so the media i think it's the medium commercial or mixed use property will pay nine percent less so um i don't know if most, most folks know but property owners typically pass along the assessment to their businesses um, you know, that's fairly standard. So I think it's really important to make the point that those savings are ultimately the savings of, you know, many small businesses um, as well. Um, and so, you know, that the concern raised by the community board was that the landscape has changed. Um, I would, I guess this is a question for them or for you, you know, what, what landscape has changed? All of the things that were outlined in the Jamaica Now action plan um, remain you know, the same. There's still duplicative services. The unification would still result in savings, uh, a reduction in overhead. So I, I would just like to understand, I mean, is it really the concern that you know, some people will be losing power or maybe losing a job? You know, is that really what we're talking about? Because the savings seem um, you know, and, and the ability to uh, do more with less with public resources, I think is, is really powerful. So, you know, I, I think I would like for, the, for that to be teased out at the hearing. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bernie. Oh, yeah, actually I had pretty much the same Sort of question as Commissioner Ortiz. Um, 
I guess we better get down to Jamaica Avenue and trip and fall and sue before you take that right away from us, right? That's gonna be, we're going to lose that. Uh, but maybe maybe Please tomorrow they can it. talk. Uh, <laughs> they can talk a little bit more about uh, what's behind the community board opposition. This kind of lack of consensus among the bids, and it sounds like there's a bit of trouble in paradise back there. So maybe they can enlighten us on that, because uh, you know, ostensibly it all seems like a sensible proposition. So what are people really concerned about? Yes, I know. Um, I was at the community hall meeting. SBS was also there. And, uh, but I know SBS have also been talking to a lot of other stakeholders and I think have a better picture. So I'll let them speak to that tomorrow. Thank you. Um, are there any additional questions? Okay, thank you, Doug. This is on for public hearing tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, ninth item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a notice of intent to acquire office space in Queens Community District 6. Our presenter is Joy Razor. Hey, good afternoon, commissioners. Next slide, please. This is a pre-hearing presentation for an application from the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services and the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation for the acquisition of 30,000 square feet of office space in order to consolidate 180 employees of the Parks Department's Central Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources Division. The project area is located at 9777 Queens Boulevard in Regal Park in Queens Community District 6. Next slide. The project area is located along Queens Boulevard within a C42 zoning district proximate to Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Next slide. The project area is coterminous with the development site and is outlined here in red. The surrounding area comprises a mix of commercial and institutional uses. Queens Boulevard to the south is the area's major commercial thoroughfare and is lined with high-density mixed-use buildings containing ground floor retail, such as fast casual restaurants, pharmacies, and grocery stores. The area also contains a few houses of worship, along with cultural and educational institutions. The area to the north is an R71 district that contains a mix of one and two family residences, as well as apartment buildings ranging from six to 13 stories in height. The development site comprises all of block 2092 with frontage along Queens Boulevard. Next slide. The development site is an existing 13 story mixed use office building bounded by Queens Boulevard to the south, 64th Road to the northwest, and 98th Street to the northeast. The site is two blocks west of the recent application for 9881 Queens Boulevard rezoning, which you'll see after this presentation. It's well served by public transit and is accessible via eight bus lines and three subway lines. The E, M, and R lines are all located three blocks west of the project area at the 63rd Road Regal Park Station. In addition, bike lanes run along Queens Boulevard directly in front of the site, and the building is accessible by car via the Long Island Expressway, the Van Wyck Expressway, and the Grand Central Parkway. Next slide. The ground floor of the building is comprised of a bank branch, a medical office, a leasing office, a university satellite campus, and the main lobby entrance, which are all located along Queens Boulevard. A delivery entrance is located at the back of the building along 98th Street, and parking would be accessed via a ramp along 64th Road. There would be approximately 46 parking spaces designated for the Parks Department's vehicle fleet. Next slide. The office space would consist of a portion of the fourth floor and the entirety of the fifth floor within the 13-story building. The office spaces would be open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. during the week, and staff would enter the building through the Queens Boulevard lobby entrance, take the elevator up to the fourth and fifth floors, and these would be secured by card access. 
The fourth floor would provide space for the relocated natural resources group, along with common area providing storage, two small conference rooms, and a pantry. The fourth floor would also share bathrooms with the adjacent tenant, which is NYU Langon, and would include an internal stairwell to the fifth floor of the parks, parks department's office space. Next slide. The fifth floor would consist of office space for the relocated forest and horticulture group, as well as Trees New York, Central Administration, and the executive office. The space would also include the main reception area, which you can see in the middle. The common spaces would consist of two small conference rooms, a large conference room, and a multi-purpose room, along with a pantry area and cook closet. Bathrooms would be located in the corridor near the elevators. Next slide. To summarize, DCAS and the Parks Department are seeking to acquire 30,000 square feet of office space to consolidate the Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources Division within an existing 13-story mixed-use commercial and office building in Regal Park. The applicant team will be able to answer questions at tomorrow's public hearing, but I'm available for any that you might have now. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Joy. Um, questions from the commission? I see Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is perhaps for tomorrow. I'd just like to know the proposed length of the lease. I can answer that. Um, it'll be a 21 year lease. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that you broke up. Oh, sorry. Um, it'll be a 21 year lease. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Knuckles. Um, Commissioner Ron Prashad, did you have a question? Uh, actually, question I, I actually yeah. had the same question. I also want to know what will they be doing with the other facilities once uh, Parks Department vacates it? The trailers, for example, at the, uh, was the Olmstead Center and the other two locations? What are their plans for those sites? Sure. Thank you. So those sites uh, will remain. They part of the acquisition of this office space is to reduce overcrowding in the existing spaces, and so they'll maintain those spaces, but just consolidate the uh, forestry, horticulture, and natural resources division within this one location at, on Queens Boulevard. Thank you. Thank you. Are, are there any additional questions for for Joy? Okay, then this will be on for hearing tomorrow. Thanks a lot, Joy. Thank you. All right. The 10th item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Queens Community District 6, uh, just down the street. Uh, our presenter is Sarah Avila. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is 9881 Queens Boulevard rezoning, which is back for pre-hearing. Next slide. This is a private application by Trilon LLC proposing two actions. The proposed actions are a zoning map amendment to change a R71C12 zoning district to an R8XC24 zoning district and a zoning text amendment to map a MIH area coterminous with the rezoning area. The project was certified at the review session on October 4th, 2021. Next slide. The project area is comprised of blocks uh, block 2105, lots 1, 10, 14, and 16. The project fronts on Queens Boulevard, a major thoroughfare. The project area is generally bounded by Queens Boulevard, a wide street to the south, 66th Avenue to the west, 99th Street, a wide street to the north, and 66th Road to the east. The project rezoning area is 21,472 square feet. The project is located on the E, M, R lines in between two MTA stations. The 67th Avenue station, two blocks to the east, and 63rd Drive Regal Park station, five blocks to the west. Next slide. The applicant is proposing a new 15 story mixed use development with 136,000 square feet of residential floor area and 17,400 square feet of commercial floor area on the ground floor. 
The building would include 158 dwelling units, 110 at market rate, and 48 affordable units. 45 accessory parking spaces would be located on the second floor, level accessible via a curb cut on 99th Street. The building would have an FAR of 7.16, 6.35 FAR for residential, and 0 0.81 FAR of commercial. The max under RAX with MIH is 7.2 FAR. The proposed zoning map amendment is to change an R71 C12 zoning district to an RAX C24 zoning district. The applicants are also requesting a zoning text amendment to establish an MIH area. Their application seeks to map MIH options one and two. The applicant is proposing 158 dwelling units. Uh, there would be 110 units at market rate, 48 units under MIH option two, or 30% uh, residential floor area. Under MIH option one, it would be 40 units or 25% residential floor area. The AMI for Queens Community District 6 is 74,636. Next slide. On December 8th, Queens Community Board 6 held a public meeting and the board voted 32 in favor, four opposed with zero abstentions to conditionally disapprove the application and discuss the following conditions. Their preference is 60% of AMI or lower, <coughs> incorporating architectural elements of the theater and uh, diners at marquee and facade, also to pursue green building certifications and to hold good faith discussions with MWBEs and local contractors. A copy of the full recommendation was included in your briefing materials. Next slide. The Queensboro president held a public hearing on December 23rd and issued a recommendation to disapprove the application with the following conditions. That the developer should commit to MIH option one, 25% at 60% AMI, and to have a goal of 30% for local hiring and use of MWBE businesses during the construction phase. Also that the developer should guarantee and offer um, space for existing tenants. Lastly, that the proposed development should um, incorporate architectural features of the existing theater and diners facades wherever possible. That concludes my presentation. The applicant team will be here tomorrow morning for the public hearing. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, questions from the commission, Commissioner Rampershaw. Yeah, um, I guess uh, I can wait for tomorrow, but uh, I'm just curious how the applicant team is gonna respond to both the community board and the borough president's comments since they both were against it. Um, that was just more of a statement. <laughs> so I'll wait until tomorrow to hear the response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Okay, this will be on for hearing tomorrow. All right, um, moving on to future votes. Um, on January 19th, 2022, uh, staff have prepared reports on 9704 Sutphin Boulevard rezoning. I will note that this report will be as modified. Um, the CPC will be removing enabling language for MIH in the special downtown Jamaica district, uh, which has already been implemented by a text amendment that was approved recently. So it's just a bit of housekeeping. It doesn't change the proposal. Um, 9907 um, Astoria Boulevard commercial overlay and the East 178th Street demapping are also on uh, prepared reports. Uh, for 1718 Decatur Street authorization and 1112 Wyckoff Avenue authorization, um, these authorizations are scheduled for a decision. Uh, Luis Garcia Martinez is here with some follow-up. Luis? Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, yes, I reached out to the applicant team to get more information in regards of both properties. Um, the applicant uh, replied that both properties are large two-family buildings that have tenants. In the case of 1718 Decatur Street, the existing two-story, uh, two-unit building was built in 1915 and is proposed to be replaced um, with a new three-story residential building with six, six dwelling units. Similarly, on uh, 1112 Wyckoff Avenue, the existing two-story, two-unit building uh, built in 1920 uh, is proposed to be replaced um, 
with a new three-story mixed-use building with 10 dwelling units. And the applicant noted that they are in good contact with all tenants and they will help them relocate and give them a good amount of time to do so. Uh, the applicant also mentioned that they would need another year to finalize DOB plans and another six to 12 months at least to start the project. So the current tenants would have 18, to, uh, 18 months, 12 years to relocate. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Are there any questions for Luis? Okay. Good. Thank okay. you. Uh, also scheduled for decision on Wednesday uh, is 875 Sinclair Avenue and 58 Buttonwood Road, um, both in Staten Island uh, for their special districts. Uh, for Post hearing follow ups, uh, we have Amboy Road reconstruction. If there are any questions on that, um, the DEP Clearview pump station city map change. Um, I'll note that questions were raised at the public hearing uh, regarding environmental justice uh, issues uh, in locating DEP facilities. Um, in response, uh, in, or in addition to the response by DEP, um, city planning staff would also note that this is a pump station and not a, a treatment facility. So the, the odor and other thing externalities are not expected from this facility. Um, the, the proposed location is in the middle of an expressway. Um, it looks like the closest residences are pro approximately 100 feet away. Um, and then the neighborhood tabulation area of Bay Terrace and Clearview where this facility is proposed to be located has a median household income of $85,000, approximately $85,000 compared to a median household income of 64,000 uh, for in New York City and uh, 69,000 for Queens. And so it's not your typical area where issues of environmental justice are a concern. Um, for 660, 668 East Fordham Road, staff is working uh, with the applicant on a comprehensive response, and they will be back on January 31st. So if there's any further questions, we can cycle those back up. Okay, I don't see anything. And then on 870, 888 Atlantic Avenue rezoning and 1034, 1042 Atlantic Avenue rezoning, we have uh, staff from the Brooklyn office here to discuss a uh, Jonah. I believe you're here. I don't know if Jesse wa wanted to jump on as well. Jonah, go ahead. Great. Thanks, Ryan. I'm also joined by Winston and, and Alex too. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, good afternoon again, commissioners. So as a post hearing follow up to the public hearings on January 5th for the 870 and 1034 Atlantic Avenue applications, uh, department staff just wanted to provide more background on a few issues that came up during the discussion. Next slide, please. So first, the staff would like to reiterate why we believe the proposed C63A district is appropriate along Atlantic Avenue. Uh, some of this will echo uh, a recent presentation we gave uh, that Jesse led in response to the um, 1045 Atlantic application, um, but we, we really want to um, hone in on some of these points. Uh, so taking a step back from the project sites and just looking from a borough-wide perspective, Atlantic Avenue really is one of the widest transit accessible corridors in Brooklyn. As part of the East New York neighborhood plan, Atlantic Avenue was rezoned to an R8A equivalent district. Uh, while in the M Crown area, we believe that a step up from RA day of approximately one FAR and three additional stories is appropriate really in light of the area's stronger connection to the Atlantic Terminal Transit Hub, to downtown Brooklyn and to other job centers. Next slide. Uh, in addition, we wanna quickly point out that as part of the recently adopted Gowanus neighborhood plan, Fourth Avenue, which is another 120 foot wide corridor was also rezoned to an R9A equivalent residential district. We regard Atlantic Avenue within the M Crown area as a similar type of corridor. Uh, really one, one of the main arteries that connects neighborhoods 
across Brooklyn. Next slide. So as we think hard about opportunities for growth in the borough, the, the areas surrounding M Crown and Prospect Heights, Crown Heights, Clinton Hill and Bed-Stuy are largely built up and mapped with low rise contextual zoning districts, as well as designated as historic districts by LPC that while being vital for preserving the, the scale of these neighborhoods, it also can really constrain the capacity for housing growth, uh, which has been a, a real planning challenge for the borough. During the, the 10 year period between 2010 and 2020, uh, according to the census, Brooklyn's population grew by approximately 231,000 people, and then by approximately 17,000, just in the census tracts overlapping within a quarter mile of M Crown. As we anticipate demand for housing within the surrounding neighborhoods to keep growing over the coming decades, we, we believe that Atlantic Avenue is an absolutely pivotal corridor, well situated to help accommodate this growth, particularly in an area with access to jobs, public transit, open space, and other services and amenities. Next slide. And then turning attention to urban design building form, we, we believe that the base and building heights in an R9A equivalent district are appropriate considering both the avenues existing with of 120 feet, uh, coupled with an additional building setback to help widen the sidewalk in a manner that enhances the streetscape. In tandem, we believe both components can allow for sufficient light and air. And also, as we heard at the public hearing, it, it can give architects more flexibility in the bulk envelope to encourage building articulation, setbacks that break up the facade and support a variety of design. Next slide. We also want to quickly note that edge conditions between low and high density districts do exist in many parts of Brooklyn, such as with the Williamsburg Savings Bank Tower by Atlantic Terminal, and also in certain areas of downtown Brooklyn, looking at uh, the corner of State Street and Smith. Uh, also, we would note that uh, zoning does require height transitions for, for these types of conditions. And apart from that, we, we do encourage private applicants always to consider opportunities to improve upon these conditions in connection with individual application proposals. Very similar to the approach for uh, 1045 Atlantic Avenue. Next slide. Second, uh, we wanted to share some background on the M Crown neighborhood planning efforts. I believe it's been a few years since we've given a more robust update to, be, to the commission, um, particularly in relation to private applicants, uh, applications that are currently in ULERP. So during um, the public hearing, there were extensive, we heard extensive testimony from local residents requesting that the applicants withdraw in favor of a neighborhood plan. We wanna clarify that the department is supportive of the community's request for a neighborhood plan. Over the past few years, we've worked to build consensus with the community board, with other stakeholders. However, the pandemic has unfortunately put a hold on some of this resource intensive work However, since the pandemic began, we wanna highlight a few public discussions we've held together with Community Board 8 on the topics of population and demographic trends, uh, two urban design uh, presentations and discussions, as well as a discussion on just general planning principles for the neighborhood and for the city. Currently, we're aiming to hold the discussion on the topic of capital and infrastructure planning. And over the past couple of years, we've started engagement with HPD, with DOT, uh, Parks Department, and other agencies to assess opportunities and challenges. Uh, in addition to that, we've also been working closely with our Capital Planning Division, who have been immensely helpful. Uh, and, and with respect to transportation in particular, I, we just want to note that Atlantic Avenue is designated the priority corridor for DOT and is part of the Great Streets and Vision Zero priority corridors for infrastructure improvements and safety enhancements. Uh, so with all that being said, while the department does seek to continue working with the community to advance an M Crown neighborhood plan, we wanna stress that this remains subject to the priorities of the new mayoral administration, who we hope to closely coordinate with uh, in the coming weeks and months as we navigate this transition period. 
Next slide. Uh, so for the third part and last part of the presentation, we'd like to discuss the general appropriateness, appropriateness of the private applications in MCrown and address a few concerns related uh, to environmental review and displacement. Uh, so while there are ongoing conversations around the future of the study and how it advances, we want to clarify that private owners do have a right to come forward and propose individual rezoning applications. For each applicant, we urge their team to meet early and uh, early and often with the community board, with other stakeholders to discuss and incorporate any feedback they have. We also believe that the framework itself represents a key consensus document that we've developed um, and, and to a large extent in partnership with the board. Uh, despite certain differences over density and height on Atlantic Avenue, we find that the framework serves as an invaluable guidepost for evaluating each application. And we also work to ensure that each proposal aligns with the framework as much as possible. Regarding questions at public hearing uh, related to environmental review for each application, I wanna note that the seeker generally requires that the analysis in each private application takes into account the growth assumptions from previous nearby applications, uh, particularly in a small geography such as MCrown. So to, to an extent, each environmental review analysis is additive rather than representing a completely isolated uh, analysis. Um, but that being said, apart from the environmental review required by Seeker, we're also in communication with partner agencies to help ensure that we're collectively planning for the cumulative growth of the neighborhood. Uh, so lastly, at, at the public hearing, there were a few questions and concerns related to displacement of current residents and more broadly, the role of rezonings and new development in displacement. Uh, we, we recognize that displacement is a key concern in the surrounding neighborhoods. There has been and continues to be a trend of rising rents and a decline in the black non-Hispanic population within the broader area. These kinds of trends reinforce the message that many residents face struggles to remain in their homes and neighborhoods, which we take very seriously. A significant part of displacement is about just helping people stay in their homes. Uh, there's been extensive work done by the city through HPD, through the mayor's office to protect tenants and other organizations to support tenants that face the threat of losing their homes, including uh, you know, from reforming rent regulation to providing legal assistance to at-risk tenants to enacting the Certificate of No Harassment pilot program. Tenant protections are important, we believe, irrespective of whether there is a rezoning or new housing being built in an area. Uh, and over the past eight years, only one to two percent of the city's land, we estimate, has been rezoned. But tenant concerns about displacement are far more, much more widespread. Uh, at the same time, we strongly believe that another key piece of addressing concerns about displacement is just the availability of homes for people of all income levels. People's lives, as we all know, are not static. Households form and change every day, whether because of marriage or divorce, the birth of a child or other life events. If a household needs to move, there needs to be an apartment available that meets their needs and that they can afford. Uh, without new housing, this means another household needs to move out. If, if more people want to move to the neighborhood, as we've seen, especially in the areas around M Crown, this increases the upward pressure on rents in existing housing. And this is what underlies the premise of applying MIH and rezonings that promote residential growth, that adding new mixed income housing increases the availability of housing for residents and a diversity of income levels. Uh, the idea that rezonings and new housing, as opposed to underlying market conditions, uh, drive up rents is really not supported by the evidence. There, there's actually a growing body of research showing that adding housing results in rents in the surrounding area being somewhat lower than they would have been without new housing. Um, that said, we recognize that residents may be experiencing rising rents, even with new housing, and that certain scenarios about what rents would be without new housing can feel abstract compared to this lived experience. Uh, but there is growing research indicating that overall rents typically uh, increase even higher 
without new housing being built. Uh, and that's a critical piece of information for decision making, uh, which we strongly believe in. Um, so with that all said, while a new building doesn't directly solve housing challenges for the neighborhood and we don't expect you know, M Crown or Atlantic Avenue to solve every all these problems, we feel strongly that each new building does make a, an important contribution to addressing this issue. Uh, and uh, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions and um, we have other folks from our team here, including Winston and Jesse. Thanks very much, Jonah. Are there questions from the commission? Commissioner Goodrich. Okay. I might have missed the exact number, but how we talk about displacement, uh, approximately how many residents are going to be displaced? In, in M Crown or can you, sorry, can you elaborate on? Are there going to be residents that will be displaced for 870 and for the Atlantic Avenue rezoning or no? No, for, for 870, there are a few units in one of in one of the development sites, but I believe that they've been vacated. I can confirm that with the, the applicant team. But apart from that, there's no uh, no displacement. Okay. Did they vacate because of the project, or they just vacated? I'm I, and I'll I can explain a little bit more about why I'm asking, but. That's the main concern of tenant advocates of, of any, like, for example, even if five people vacate um, and even if they move, um, you know, the main concern is that, so, you know, that was said at the hearing is just like, that is considered displacement as well. So I guess what I'm trying to figure out for myself is like, what is the actual number of displacement um, and I understand that the concerns that were raised at the hearing were in large, it, it's twofold. One is actual people that are being displaced. And then also like what will happen as a result of the project and raising rents and how many people will be pushed out. But I think what I'm also trying to find out is are there actual people being pushed out by the project, even if they moved, you know, beforehand, because maybe, I, I don't know, but that's my question of if there, you know, even if there are five people, are there actual residents that, you know, left on account of the project? Either they were told or they left because of the project. Got it. But by the way, thank you so much for for honing in on that and clarifying. I really appreciate that. I'm going to just confirm with the applicant team on the the number of units that and just the current status because I don't want to speak. I want to be sure exactly of that. Um, I just want to clarify for 1034 Atlantic Avenue, um, their project, there are no residential units within their project, um, but there are certain, there are two residential buildings that are within the project area, but we don't anticipate those uh, to be redeveloped um, because they're quite small, they're already built up. Um, uh, to your second question, do, I'm, did I, do I have it wrong? So which Atlantic are we talking about? We're talking about, I'm, 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 I'm humble enough to admit if I'm wrong, if I have the wrong building. So are we, which, which one are we um, talking about for Atlantic right now? Uh, so 870 right, Atlantic right, right, right. is, is the one where uh, their project, their development site does have okay. a building with some units. So I want to confirm um, okay. The other right, project. Okay. okay, great. All right, so I just want to make sure I would would have been would have been funny if you said we're talking about like five Atlantic Avenue or something like no. Um, my other question is, and this is kind of separate, I guess, from what you were talking about, but it's something that comes up frequently in CPC hearings and also certainly came up here is um, the sort of like promise versus accountability. A lot of developers, you know, when they testify, one of the main things, the promise is we're gonna bring in jobs. And then, you know, you have unions, they might talk to unions and then they also come and testify in support. 
I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, there's such a variation between the promise and then when the, the project actually goes through. Is there like, is there any measure for accountability there or is there, you know, is there, or is it just, you know, that, that's what, that's the main thing. And I think that's also a, a question that I think a lot of people have, um, especially germane to this particular project. Got it. I'm sure others will want to weigh in, but I would just say for the 1034 Atlantic project, um, that applicant is actually the same developer as a, he proposed an application that was approved a couple years ago uh, in MCrown that's currently being developed. Uh, so there, I would say apart from any like written agreement or legal agreement that they intend to enter, um, that developer has kind of formed this relationship with the board uh, with many stakeholders. So, um, but that being said, I, I, let me just check in with the applicant team. I know my understanding is that they are uh, in the process of uh, coming to an agreement, uh, actually both written and a legal agreement apart from the application uh, related to uh, the use and MIH. Um, but I'm not aware of, I just wanna check the current status of that. I, I, as a, I'll just jump in as a, as a now longtime observer of city planning commission hearings. My experience is that if unions come in support of something, it usually means that they have a, a, a contract yeah. of some sort with with the developer who's there, and 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 you'll and, mm -hmm. and if you watch these long enough, you'll actually have them come and say we haven't gotten to that point yet, and we want to, and so therefore we're not supporting this until we get to that point. So the unions are are usually very um, thoughtful about how they uh, present themselves in this process. That's been okay. my experience. That's really helpful. Um, okay. All right, thank you. And, and Commissioner Goodrich, I would just add that, you know, during this process, there are different types of promises people make. Some of them are directly germane to gen making and those get codified and are legally enforceable pursuant to our land use action. Sometimes there are other promises that are made to city council members and others and they may have an agreement, Those, they're not enforceable in the same way as ours are. And as your tenure goes on, you will begin to clearly distinguish between the two types of you know, promises and commitments that are made, because you're right. There are many representations made about things that will happen, but all, they're not all equal representations and they're not all enforceable in the same way. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Levin. Yeah, I was going to essentially say the same thing, um, but I think Commissioner Gooders is asking and giving us an opportunity to reinforce an important point, which is the applications here are just for zoning map amendments and for text amendments um, to apply MIH. We have no power, unfortunately, as the Planning Commission to compel the building, the, the developer to build any particular building. Um, we just put the rules on the map for the shape of the building that they can eventually build. Um, so when they come in saying they're building a certain number of units or set back here and there, we can't make that stick. We have no way to make that stick. Um, there is very commonly a conversation that happens at the city council level where there is a political agreement reached um, and documented that communities can then use to hold the developers to what they have promised. But we don't have that power. Can I ask a follow-up to that question, Commissioner Levin? Yeah. Is, there, is there a way, like for example, if there's the same developer that comes before the commission, I mean, is it appropriate to just ask them like about prior projects? Like you promised this on, pri on five prior projects, how did that promise match the reality? Or is it that, is that allowed or is that, it, it, I'm just wondering, like, as part of the EULA, is it, oh, is it appropriate to ask developers about the, if they've come before about prior projects, or is that illegal? I don't know. I should, I should let uh, our chair take a first swing at that, because I'm just a regular old commissioner yeah. here. But there's, you know, there, there's real power, and, know, there's, and, and there's soft power. We have a lot of soft power. <laughs> right. 
Yes. Uh, you know, Commissioner Goodridge, we, you can ask any question that you want, whether or not it is directly related to the land use action or not. And there will be an answer on the record. Strictly speaking though, your consideration of the actions that are before you really have to be based on land use planning and can't really be determined by extraneous factors, which some of these things are to the land use actions in front of you. But as Commissioner Levin said, you know, you've asked a question, it's been answered and that will clearly color your thinking, but we really can't make determinations that are based on things like, is the guy a good guy? Is he an honorable person? It's really, is this land use action appropriate in the context that it's being sought in? That's really what we're asked to do. Right. The city and council also, has much broader purview in that regard than we do. And we also have to keep an eye on not what the developer is or the applicant is proposing to build, which is sometimes as a result of conversations with the community, they say, okay, well, we'll take it down a story. We have to look at what the reasonable worst case development scenario is um, because often a developer will flip a site, you have a new developer come in who is not part of those conversations and they're just gonna build according to the zoning. So it's important um, for us to keep an eye on both things, what the community, what the developer says they're gonna build and what the, then the maximum possibility is for them to build, for somebody else, they or anybody else to build under the zoning that gets put on the books. Thank you. Commissioner Bernie. I mean, not to prolong this conversation <laughs> for hours longer, but you might speak quickly, uh, Chair Lermont, to the issue of community benefits agreements, which are sometimes added to these applications and they come through. Yes, you know, um, actually there was just an article today entitled what happened to community benefit agreements because I don't think they're being seen as much, but you know, those are agreements that are extraneous to the rezoning, but that community members, frequently community boards and other stakeholders work on with developers to get commitments for things that are outside of zoning, but that they think are important to accomplish if the zoning action that is before us is to be, you know, approved by the city. People think that, you know, there are impacts from approving greater density in a neighborhood and will frequently ask for developers to commit to certain things that are beyond our purview to make a developer do. And those are frequently uh, seen where, particularly where it's a larger, um, you know, impacting development that is before us for consideration. But the city doesn't, doesn't sign on to those. Those are really between the developer and the community. And, and you have to say that you they're, often more honored in, they're often more honored in the breach than the Sorry, go ahead. themselves, Bert. right? Yeah. Absolutely. Because they're, they're hard to be enforced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have another question, okay, Commissioner so this, Goodrich? This question is okay to ask, right? This is, this is what I want to know, because I would like to ask these questions. Just because, like, for example, if someone, you yes. know, like sometimes some companies are like, yeah, we want to take funding. We want to you know, hire like women. That's what we want, like for diversity. And then like they get the funding and then they only hire women and say like certain roles that have like no power. This is like, I'm thinking of like an analogy. And so for me, if you frequently come before the commission five, six, seven times in 10 years, and each time, you know, you make a, you say, I'm going to do this. And then the reality doesn't match the promise. I don't know. I think that's fair game to, you know, that's the land use. I, I don't, I, I guess I'm, I just want to make sure that's an appropriate question to to ask that it doesn't like out you know go outskirts of Eula, but but you know it's it's more about you've come before the commission for the same type of request before or a similar request and you know how did your promise before match did you actually follow through and if you didn't kind of like why why exactly should we believe you now um, that you're saying that all of it, that this is gonna bring 10,000 jobs or whatever and et cetera, et cetera. 
that's I just want to make yes. sure I'm not again asking. you can I, certainly ask okay the question right. oh I know yeah okay thank you okay. Thank you thank you are there any additional questions okay well thank you very much Jonah Thanks, Anita. I just want to quickly note that, you know, to the point about CBAs, we've actually been working with the board for many years. And I'd like to think that, um, you know, there's some form of accountability just with the relationship we've had with, um, with many community groups. So I think, you know, even in, uh, you know, as we move forward, you know, we we're also closely tracking each of these proposals and the status of them. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Yes. Commissioners come and go, but the staff at DCP are always watching. <laughs> um, thank you, Jonah. And uh, moving <laughs> on, we have, we have uh, the East New York Urban Renewal Plan Fifth Amendment. If there's any further questions on that. Um, Castle 3, this is 107, 111 East 123rd Street. I believe that for post hearing, nothing on that. And then, um, 23, we added this to post hearing um, and Andy will try to explain. Uh, 2325 Cleveland Place, um, which is a zoning text amendment. And Andy, why don't you tell us what's happening here? Go for it, yes. Yeah. So 2325 Cleveland Place, um, this has been almost a year since you've seen it. Um, so I'll briefly uh, just refresh everyone's memory on the project itself um, and then discuss developments that have happened since the hearing. Um, so 2325 Cleveland Place, this is a zoning text amendment to modify the boundaries of the special Little Italy District and Manhattan Community District 2, uh, seen here between Spring and Kenmare Streets. Um, the applicant is proposing to develop an eight-story, 30,000 square foot office and retail development. Next slide, please. So on your left are the boundaries of uh, the special Little Italy district. In the inset, you can see that uh, area C is mapped 100 feet north of Kinmare Street. On your right is the uh, proposal before you, uh, which is to map area C 125 feet north from Kinmare Street. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is zooming in a little bit. Uh, this is the, the frontage, the east frontage of Cleveland Place, north is to your left. Um, the applicant owns two lots. Uh, the southern lot, which is on your right, uh, is currently governed by area C regulations. The uh, lot on your left is currently governed by area A regulations. So moving the boundary 25 feet north would bring both lots under area uh, C regulations. Next slide, please. So uh, area C is more permissive than area A. So this is a table sort of summarizing the main distinctions between the two. Um, area C has a slightly uh, more permissive range of uses than area A. Uh, in terms of FARs, uh, area A, the maximum FAR is 4.1 for all uses. In area C, uh, it's a range, it's 4.8 for residential uses, 6.5 for community facility, and six for commercial. Uh, the other main difference uh, is for maximum lot coverage. In area A, it's 60% for all uses. In area C, it's 60% for residential, but then for commercial, it's 100% on the ground floor and then 70% above the ground floor. Uh, height in area C is slightly more permissive, 85 feet or eight stories uh, versus 75 feet or seven stories in area A. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just an existing elevation showing the two buildings. They are two uh, separate uh, tenements uh, with ground floor retail. Uh, there are approximately eight residential units between the two, and my understanding is that there are no uh, rent regulated units. Next slide. Uh, this is an elevation showing the proposed development. Uh, and here you can see uh, the difference between area A and area C uh, height regulations. Next slide. 
Uh, so recommendations, community board two voted 42 to one to disapprove the application. Uh, most of their concerns had to do with the impact of intensifying commercial uses, uh, mostly related to quality of life issues like uh, increased traffic, uh, refuse, noise, things like that. Um, the, the buildings had a number of uh, DOB and ECB violations and complaints, which I'll get to on the next slide. Uh, they're particularly worried about uh, large scale retail over 10,000 square feet and use group 10A. Uh, they were concerned about the expansion of eating and drinking uses on the ground floor, um, concerned about the elimination of the rear yard, which uh, many of the buildings on the Mulberry Street side look down on. Um, and then lastly, the uh, design of the building itself, particularly the, the treatment of the facades. Uh, the borough president uh, recommended disapproval with conditions uh, that the applicant meet with the neighbors and come up with uh, a plan that addresses all of their uh, concerns. Next slide, please. So in response, the applicant has submitted a letter to uh, the commission um, they have agreed to enter into a private restrictive declaration to limit uh, use group 10A large retail and use group 12A clubs. Um, I'll just note that uh, these private restrictive declarations, the city will not be a party to those. Um, they won't be responsible for enforcing whatever restrictions that the applicant voluntarily enters into. Uh, the applicant won't commit to keeping the ground floor spaces separate or limiting their square footage. Uh, they will, however, commit to improving uh, the rear yard or the rear terrace rather with uh, foliage and green elements and explore the preservation of existing trees. Um, they have decided to, to redesign the building to be more context sensitive. Uh, my understanding is uh, the design was previously for an all glass facade and they have opted for um, red brick, uh, so a more historic treatment. Um, there were a number of uh, violations, all of which were for uh, non-hazardous class two or class three conditions. Um, so for example, the last one which was cleared was for a wooden structure in the rear yard that was constructed without a permit for seating during the pandemic. Um, all class one violations have been resolved and there are no open class one complaints. Um, there were uh, the greatest volume of um, complaints had to do with noise from uh, patrons in the rear yard um, and neighbors asserting that that was not an allowed use in the rear yard. That in fact is not true. So all of those complaints were, um, were dismissed. Uh, the applicant has provided a number of uh, letters and support from tenants, both at this site and other buildings that they own, attesting to the applicant's history as a, uh, a good landlord and have provided reduced rent or free space for artists in the past. Um, if you remember, there was a little bit of press related to a building in Tribeca at 46 Lisbonard that the applicant also owns. There was a, a noisy party um, and a number of complaints. They've also provided a letter from the management company there um, detailing how they address and will address um, uh, concerns related to, to noise and things like that as well as letters of support from the residents uh, of that building. Um, so that is all I have. Um, this is currently scheduled for a vote on the 31st, um, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, are there any questions from the commission on this? Commissioner Levin. Um, yeah, well, you've answered my main question is whatever happened to this one? It's been hanging around on my list wondering where, where it was going. You know, this was one of the weirdest, hardest hearings um, we had in the last stretch of time. Um, it was really pretty ugly. And it, you know, it kind of gets to the questions that Commissioner Goodrich was asking about earlier about the nature of the things you can ask about what appears to be a pretty 
straightforward um, uh, zoning application turns out to have a whole lot of color attached to it um, that make you really cautious about um, moving forward. Um, I don't think I've ever recalled a hearing where there was so much ugly testimony about the applicant's intentions and so ineffective a response from the applicant um, in admittedly a very heated situation, but the applicant didn't help themselves at the public hearing. Um, for me, the main planning issue here is about the possibility of creating another large eating and drinking establishment in an area that is already saturated with bars and restaurants. And the fact that they, I'm glad that they will um, uh, commit to eliminating the large uh, retail space, the use group 12A, troubled that it would have to be in a restrictive declaration that um, has really very few legal teeth to it um, if the community doesn't stand up and try to enforce it. Um, and, uh, but would, and that they're refusing to agree not to um, leave the two retail establishments separate. So uh, I think those retail establishments have to stay separate um, for quality of life in the neighborhood. I don't think there's a good planning rationale for creating a large ground floor space. Um, and on that basis, I'm gonna vote no on this. Oh, I guess I would ask, has this been, before I sound off, have you um, referred this to the community board and do we have their response to the presentation you've just made or the additional commitments that the applicants made? They should have an opportunity to let us know what they think. I don't have a response from the community board. Are they aware of these changes? Um, I'll have to double check. Okay. How, if the applicant has reached out to them a, a second time. So I'll get back to you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bernie. Uh, thank you. Uh, Andy, could we see the revised and more contextual design that they've come up with? I don't have it, but I can send it to you. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Goodrich. Um, there are many, there are, there are um, many good landlords in New York City. I will admit that. Um, but um, it is actually when when a tenant decides to bring a lawsuit, uh, mostly for repairs against them, it, it means that it's really hit the last resort. And uh, what I'm wondering is, is this have has there been like a search to see if this if any tenants have filed any, you know, any kind of case against this landlord? Because um, I know the you know the landlord has tenants. Who, um, who who can attest to um, being a great landlord, which which is fine. Um, and that's one way to see, but I'm also wondering, you know, if there are any lawsuits against in public databases. Um, it's not typically practice to search for um, actions uh, against an applicant. Um, for prior lawsuits. Prior. For prior lawsuits. This just yeah. sort of, you know, um, I don't know. I, I, it's, re it's very hard for, in my experience, to file a sort of frivolous case. So most cases against the landlords, there really is like something there. So I, I guess I was curious. Um, okay. Yes, we don't, we don't typically, you know, do that kind of work. In in this instance, there was a lot of feedback as Commissioner Levin uh, referenced from the public through our process. So I think we have a pretty good sense about this landlord from, from the information that we have. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you, Andy. Thank you. All right. Uh, Ryan, that, is there any other business? There are no, there's no further business on our agenda today. So this will conclude the review session uh, for Tuesday, January 18th. The time is 4.25 p.m. Thank you. I see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.